Een hele laffe hummus. Een hele laffe hummus. Even kijken. Um, de hummus is beter als je het uh, uit elkaar haalt. Even kijken. Um, ik heb hier, dan komt uh, Marian van Herwijnen. Ja. Uh, die ken ik niet, maar goed. Uh, dan gaan we naar Mirko Barbero. Ja, daar is hij. Hi Mirko. Hello. I think we met online once, but I'm not really sure. Welkom in de Heek. Dank je wel. En uh, na Marco gaan we, naar Mirko gaan we naar vier, drie presentaties drie. van de landen. Nee, uh, drie. Ja, drie. Wie doen dat? Uh, uh, de eerste is uh, Peter. Zijn so slides zitten hier, maar hij kan ook share. Hey, hoe heet hoe online. Peter nog verder? Peter Lacour.
Ja, als de mensen binnen zijn. Even wat zeggen. Ah, zo. Ja. 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 So that, that that area there is my students. Are we technically able to start? Willkommen, bienvenido. And then I'm sorry, I don't run out of languages. Uh, my name is Mark Nau. Uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, event on No Net Land Tech, uh, both here uh, at B30 in The Hague as well as the people online. Uh, I hope technically everything is working. I'm always a little bit. Uh, Anxious to see if the if the technical aids are really working. Um, I'm going to start by first introducing the two organizers of this event, since not everyone may know us. My name is Mark Nau. I'm the department head of spatial planning and environmental quality at the PBL, the National Research Institute for Environmental Policy. Uh, we, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, are a public sector body working directly for government ministries and parliament, but at the same time, we are completely independent. All our research is made available to the public, no matter if it's good or bad news for the Dutch policymakers. In addition to writing reports, we also help to improve decision-making by organizing, organizing events like this one this afternoon. So again, that's it, welcome. Uh, welcome, bienvenuto. Um, uh, I'm now going to hand over the floor to Marianne van Herwijnen from ESPON, our co-organizer. Thank you, Mark. Yes, um, I'm from ESPON. Uh, ESPON is uh, located in Luxembourg and ESPON is an uh, EU-funded program um, that is, uh, and it aims to support uh, EU development policies, in particular the cohesion policy with facts and evidence, and also all our research is uh, freely available via the ESPON website. And, um, and also we, we aim to, to bring um, these evidence and facts uh, closer to the people and the policy makers. And therefore we have contact points, which uh, PBL is the one uh, in, in the Netherlands. And um, all the studies within the ESPON program have a, have a territorial focus, 
which means that uh, our analysis um, are adjusted to the specificities and the needs of the people and the places we are looking at. And uh, besides that, the, the, the results are available via the, the website. Um, it's also, uh, we also have more active ways to be involved. Um, if you are, for example, a, a policy maker and you have a specific policy need for territorial evidence, then you can send us a proposal for a targeted analysis. And if your proposal is selected, we will take care of the implementation, <coughs> the implementation um, in close cooperation with, uh, with you as a stakeholder. But if you are a researcher, you can also tender to implement one of uh, our projects, um, of, of this, uh, this targeted analysis, or also European research projects. But at the moment, we have uh, five uh, calls for tenders open. In relation to the topic of, of reducing uh, land take, it's good to know that we are also working together with the Belgian presidency team to organize uh, our uh, seminar in June next year on the same topic. And for that, we are planning to, to draft a, a policy paper <coughs> on the topic. And, and um, if you are um, a, a researcher, very knowledgeable in the field, which probably you all are because you are here for the, for the, the same topic, um, then it, 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 it would be um, interesting for me to, to learn about your, your view on the topic. And also, if you are a policymaker and you know a, a very interesting uh, and useful um, uh, case study or application of, of non net land take in, in practice, then uh, we would also, I would also like to, to learn about that. So, time for me to stop talking. I promise to be very short. And if you have um, any questions or uh, issues to share, I will go a lot. Yeah, thank you, Marion. Um, first, for the ESPOM contact point, we have a, an ESPOM contact point person. That's David Evers who is organizing this. Uh, so, uh, any questions on international cooperation, or if you're doubting international cooperation, talk to David within two minutes. You will be convinced of um, of international cooperation. And um, for the research we did, he was helped by Bas van Bemmel, who is sitting in the back, um, who uh, recently in Portugal uh, disclosed that we are uh, taking land. Uh, 10 hectares per day, so that's 20 soccer pitches a day in the Netherlands, which I think a lot of people in the Netherlands don't realize that it's um, that amount of speed in taking land. Um, and uh, also uh, standing over there is Arjan Harbers, uh, sort of in the corner, but he's also um, one of the people involved in our international cooperation and um, uh, especially with our neighbors. Um, and of course, we're a small country, so uh, we're always very close to our neighbors. Um, today's event is called Reducing Land Take Examples from Abroad. Uh, in my opinion, abroad, I always think on the other side of the pond. So that's Great Britain or, uh, or the United States. But in this case, abroad are our close and nearby neighbors, uh, Flanders in Belgium, uh, Germany, Deutschland. Uh, and Luxembourg. So um, uh, we're trying to learn from our neighbors, as we call it in Dutch, gluren bij de buren, taking a sneak peek with our neighbors how they are doing. So uh, hopefully we learn a lot. Uh, it follows up on the event we had in January, where we started uh, the debate among Dutch planners on the EU's ambition to stop urban development and greenfields. Green fields. Um, what I remember from that conference was it was in Dutch, and we had our friends from Flanders joining. <coughs> and at the end, somebody said the Dutch planning community is still in denial. And I think that's still true for this topic, that our community of Dutch uh, spatial planners is in denial of um, this possibly um, very effective um, European regulation. To let people know that January that the EU, EU, EU directive was on its way. And I think they were woken up, but I'm sure Ron will say something about it later on this afternoon. Um, I think we were successful in, in that first uh, event because we don't have to explain what land take is anymore. And we took a lot of time to explain what it was to Dutch planners. Um, today we're taking the next step. The proposal for the directive has been published. 
it's now time to talk to our neighbors and with our neighbors. How do they fuel intake? How are they trying to reduce it? And is that working? Can or should we do the same? Are they leading by example? I hope this results in a fruitful exchange and that you all walk away or at home, leave, the, leave our meeting online, uh, enriched, informed, and ready to take action. We have a great lineup today with keynotes from the European Commission, NPW researchers, and our S point contact point, as well as experts from Flanders, Germany, and Luxembourg. Afterwards, you will get the opportunity to go into more deep depth in breakout sessions after the, the break. Um, and for those of you online, we kindly ask you to add which work you would like to attend to your online name. In that way, we know how to divide the groups. So if you want to join online the, a breakout session with the European Commission, please add EC to your name. If you want to do Flanders or Belgium, add FL or BE to your name. Um, the same goes for Germany. You can do GE or DL for Deutschland and uh, LU for Luxembourg. So if you add that to your online name, we know how we can divide you later on. Uh, for the people present here, all instructions will uh, come in the break uh, after we have the keynotes. Um, for the online attendance, if you have any questions or uh, comments, please put those in the chat. But before all that, please welcome Mirko Barbero from the DG Environment of the European Commission. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, <laughs> Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation, for giving me this uh, opportunity to to present. Uh, it will come with me. Yes, yes. Click. Yes. click. That's me, and that's the title of the, my presentation: 15 minutes to have a, uh, at least an overview of what is the policy of the European Union on soil and uh, uh, how the proposal for the soil monitoring law fits in this. What are the purposes? What is the context? What is the link? Especially, what is the link with land take? Um, there will be also, as said, a breakout session uh, specifically on the soil monitoring law proposal, on the details, and especially asking the question, uh, which are the best practices, the good practices that could help in the implementation of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, soil monitoring law when it will become a law. I would start from the cost context. Where does it come from? The soil policy has been defined in the soil strategy, <coughs> which comes from the EU biodiversity strategy, which is a key initiative of this is the European Green Deal. So the current commission led by Ursula von der Leyen, uh, where the executive vi uh, vice president was Hans Timmermans uh, until uh, recently. Uh, yes, um, this is a summary of the Green Deal. So a strategy for a green growth. There is a growth. There is the green side trying to put them together. And you see there the challenges. So zero pollution, um, climate ambition, and then uh, uh, others. But the, the, the key one where the, the soil policy starts is the preserving and restoring ecosystem and biodiversity. Uh, in the soil strategy, the European Commission committed to present a proposal, and we did it this July uh, on the 5th. why there is a, a policy on, on soil, which challenges has to face, which problem has to address. Uh, yes, the best assessment we have of the condition of soils in the EU is that 60 to 70 percent of them are in unhealthy condition. Um, what does it mean, health, soil health? That's about the capacity of soil to uh, provide ecosystem services. So, um, production of biomass, 
food, uh, timber, uh, all what you want. Um, water cycling, so uh, filtering water, retaining water, um, then uh, absorbing carbon and keeping uh, solid organic carbon, so which helps also to mitigate uh, climate change. And then uh, it's the basis of uh, habitats, so of biodiversity. So there are many ecosystem services which are key for life on Earth and for the human well-being. So if soil are not healthy, then we have a problem. That's that's the point. Uh, and here there are just a few of the figures uh, that show what what this means. So we have a problem of soil erosion. So the top soil, the most fertile soil, is washed away, and then uh, we have a problem with the production of uh, food, for example. We have uh, uh, issues with contaminated, the, the, well, the uh, heavy heritage from the past industrial activity of uh, almost three million potentially contaminated sites in Europe, which represent a, a potential risk for human health and for the environment. Um, then soil that are managed in an unsustainable way, they are releasing carbon and thus contributing to the uh, uh, climate change. <clears throat> and then you see uh, land take, which is taking um, mostly agricultural land out of production. So uh, yes, we need uh, we need to build uh, constructions, uh, homes. We need to live in homes, but uh, we have to be aware that this means uh, often that we are we will be have less capacity to produce food in in that place. Uh, this is not just for soil. All this soil degradation is costing more than 50 billions a year to the EU citizens. They are hidden costs. They are uh, in terms. I mean, those costs are in terms of loss of uh, ecosystem services. What I was mentioning before. All of this has been uh, put together. So the current knowledge has been put in the impact assessment that supports. The, uh, the proposal on the soil monitoring law, you will find it online. It's about 1000 pages because that's a, a lot. Uh, but still, there are a lot of gaps in the knowledge of soil. So we need to know more. But based already on what we know, we can say that we have a, a problem and we want, uh, we are looking for a solution. Yeah, I was mentioning before that healthy soils uh, is meaningful for us because uh, it it contributes to the major challenges we have currently in, in the world. Climate change, loss of soil biodiversity, um, natural disasters, often due to floodings, where soil can contribute to retain water, so to decrease the, the impact, uh, but also increase the resilience on uh, uh, against drought. Obviously, food security depends on healthy soils, and uh, human health depends on also on healthy soils. So the soil strategy in November 2021 came by setting a, a vision for 2050. By 2050, so in more, a bit more than one generation, we need time to do the transformation. All soils will be healthy, so they will be able to answer our needs, uh, our multiple needs, and uh, contribute to address the, the main challenges. Um, in the soil strategy, there is this vision, and then there are some 80 uh, concrete actions proposed, not only from the Commission, but also from uh, for member states, to address this, to go in the direction, to start this change towards healthy soils in 2050. Uh, and these actions are contributing to the existing objectives. So there was already uh, an objective with the goal, I mean, the goal of no net land take by 2050. It was mentioned first in the roadmap in, 20, in 2011, which was a communication of the Commission. But then it was taken over in the seventh uh, environmental action program of the EU, uh, which is uh, also adopted by the Council and uh, the Parliament. So it's now a, a EU goal, so a goal of the European Union to reach no net land take by 2050. And this has to be uh, 
there, is, there should be a progress in that. That's why we have set and proposed actions for that. For example, member states in the soil strategy, they are called <coughs> to set by the end of this year, their own national, regional, local targets <coughs> to reduce net intake. So that we start going, uh, well, we start with progress in going towards non Atlantic. Um, another uh, actions asked to member states is to integrate the land take hierarchy in, in their uh, urban greening plans and so on, and f phasing out financial incentives that would go against this. Now, uh, this is not law, so it's a uh, voluntary action. It's a call to member states. There is no obligation for that, but that's also important to, to make this call. And this is a summary of uh, the land take hierarchy presented in the uh, soil strategy. Um, to try to avoid additional land take as, and sealing as much as possible. Why? Because, as, as, I, as I said, we soil will be losing the capacity to produce food to uh, be the basis for biodiversity to filter water um, in general. Um, and often to absorb as well uh, soil organic carbon. If it is not possible to avoid land take or sealing, uh, then try to reuse as much as possible la land that is already taken or sealed. Um, and uh, anyway, try to minimize the land taken and the impact that this has in the loss of capacity of soil and try to compensate as much as possible uh, this loss that will of uh, ecosystem services that will be uh, the impact. Uh, and then there are the actions where the Commission committed to, I will start from the second one, to provide uh, an updated guidance. There is already a guidance on how to avoid soil sealing, that's from 2013. Uh, many things have uh, evolved and changed. We have uh, we can uh, develop the knowledge base. So uh, we have already started the work to go towards new guidelines <coughs> on how to reach uh, non atlantic and they are due by the end of next year. So we have launched uh, a contract with the consultant who has uh, already sent invitation to. Uh, selected stakeholders to participate to a platform to exchange uh, their black practices and so on. If you have not been invited and you are interested and you want to contribute, then you are welcome to, to send an email to uh, our functional mailbox, which is env line soil in uh, at ec.europa.eu. It will be in the last slide uh, for the, also for those participating in the breakup section. Um, and then another action was to propose uh, uh, to um, come with a proposal for a legal framework where land take is defined in a common way because every member state uh, is thinking to probably a different thing. We see very many main differences. Um, Consider obligations. Well, there are obligations for member states to report on progress uh, in land take reduction. And also, there are uh, elements where sus the sustainable use of soil requires some uh, mitigation principles uh, on land take. This was in end 2021. Now we have come with the soil monitoring law or Proposal for a directive on soil monitoring and resilience. That's the, the full name. Uh, this is a summary of it. Uh, you see there are seven blocks, um, objectives, definitions, and so on. The most relevant for land take, I would say they are uh, the second one, where there is a definition of land take, what we mean by, by land take, how it should be measured. Uh, an obligation in the, in, the, in the block three for member states to report every year on the, the land take and soil sealing. Then in the in block five, uh, 
there are the principles for land take mitigation. And then, yeah, okay, contaminated sites is relevant in the sense that uh, if you remediate contaminated sites, then you can reuse them. So we are reducing land take because we are reusing land that was already taken. So that's why relevant. And on reporting, uh, we have tried to, to require provisions to member states to report on land take, but with the, the minimal burden, because we know that that's a, a key point. So using uh, digital solutions, um, with, uh, as, as harmonized as possible, but giving flexibility to member states to adapt for, for many things. That's in summary what I will be presenting more in detail in the, in the breakout session. That's where uh, that's where we are discussing. So the Commission now is has presented this proposal to the Council, so the Member States representatives, and to the Parliament, so elected by uh, by citizens. They are the legislator. They will uh, decide with a quite long process which will be the law. It may be modified uh, slightly or maybe even more substantially. This we will have to see. Uh, it will take time. There will be European elections which will stop the process. Uh, so we hope and expect that the law will come into force. Well, yeah, will be adopted and come into force in 2025. Um, but why waiting for the law? We know that uh, this is something we have already to go for. So let's already think forward and imagine how uh, we we can already today and in the future in, uh, go towards non ethnic take and also implement the, the provisions, specific provisions of, uh, of the soil monitoring law. I think my time is over and for me, that was my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm from uh, PBL and from ESPON here. And um, who's ready to take some land? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Let's go take land. And uh, that's probably precisely the feeling that I had first time that I heard about no net land take. There's a bit of confusion. What are we talking about here? It doesn't sound very good, actually, taking land. You're not asking for it. You're not buying it. You're taking it. It sounds like theft. And I'm a, um, a planner. And in planning terms, especially in the United States, it's about downzoning, reducing values. So something bad. So uh, land take, when I first thought it, that sounds like uh, something we don't want to, uh, to have anything to do with. Um, I'm going to talk a bit, not so much about the why we want to reduce land take, uh, but a bit what? What is land take? Can I can we uh, clear up that confusion that I have? And and how we're, we're going to be asked to to monitor this? But first we have to know what to monitor, and then we have to know about you know how to reduce it and how to monitor it. So those are bigger issues than you might think. Um, so back to my uh, confusion. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a bad thing, uh, but when you really get to the definition. It's not about taking land, land isn't disappearing, it's not going into the wrong hands, it's changing from function for the planners out there. Uh, it's converting from non-urban to urban use is what we usually say, more or less. There's some uh, definition questions here. Urbanization, so when you look at it that way, okay, stopping urbanization, especially on greenfield sites, that's something that planners traditionally strive for. We want compact cities generally, we want to have efficient land use generally. We want to have open spaces. So these are all things that we really want. So it sounds like this land take really is in line with what we as planners uh, want to do, should be doing. Um, so there is a bit of, let's say, translation problem here. Um, but there's also some real substantive differences here. Uh, planners generally don't think in terms of absolute <laughs> norms. Europe is extremely diverse. And to say one norm, every place should go non-Atlantic all over Europe, that's something that usually 
is is counter runs counter to how planners think. They usually think what is good for this specific place. Um, also, what are the competing land uses? It's not just about one issue, land take, but many other issues: housing, uh, about uh, infrastructure, uh, economic development, all of these other things. And how can we reconcile this the most? So, land take is one one part of the larger puzzle. So this is a bit of uh, also different chain difference in mentality, let's say, between planners uh, and, and this known Atlantic. Um, but yeah, how do we get to the what and how do we get to the how? Uh, we already heard this exists a long time. In the first seminar, people were thinking this is coming out of nowhere. No, it's not. This is all more than 10 years old. It's just not uh, really well known among planners. And we are the ones who are probably going to have to implement known Atlantic. So it's probably good that we do know about this. Um, and now there's even a proposal for a law, which we just read about. Um, and we have to set up a monitoring system because how can you reduce something if you don't know what to reduce? Uh, and you need a good definition. And there is a definition, but I don't know if it's really a good definition because there's a lot of details that still need to be worked out. And as everyone knows, the devil's in the details. You know, what do we really mean here? And so I'm going to give a couple of examples of, let's say, gray areas, issues, which we probably will have to resolve if we want to set up a good monitoring system. Um, and that is, let's say, the first take on land take. Uh, if we look at a conversion of an area from one use to another, and we're thinking in terms of binary conversion, it was non-urban, it becomes urban, it's pretty easy. Once we have that definition down, we can just calculate in terms of hectares and we know how much <laughs> land take has occurred. And that's this first quantitative uh, uh, approximation, uh, interpretation. And we did some research on this in, in the ASPON uh, program. And uh, we came out that there's almost you know, more, more than a million hectares being taken, being urbanized in the last 20 years. So, 18 year period that we studied. Um, is that a lot? I don't know. In terms of the total landmass of Europe, maybe not that much. Uh, it's certainly a lot more than zero. That's that's uh, <laughs> very, very much true. So, uh, and you see that it's being, let's say, taken in different parts of Europe. So not every area is being, uh, uh, having the same amount of land take. Good news, if you look over time, it seems to be getting less and less and less. Um, so those are three periods, each time less and less land take. Uh, next update is 2024. No, we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it's going to go back up, but uh, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, a lot of Dutch people here. Um, we also did calculations about member states. Uh, who's taking the most land? And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that the Netherlands is doing quite well. We're taking lots and lots of land. Uh, we're number six in Europe, even for a small country. That's impressive. If you look at that calculated according to our total <coughs> land mass, uh, yeah, we're camp just European champions. We're uh, taking the most uh, land uh, per, per land mass. So uh, I guess uh, if you're wanting to get this down to zero, the question is, or the, the big uh, issue is, we have to change the way we do things. We have to change the way we do planning, we have to change the way we uh, develop land. Uh, and, and even in the ranks of how fast we're doing it, how rapidly we're doing it, we're also at the top of Europe. So this really means that uh, a change in mentality, a change in practices is necessary. A couple of other figures. Everyone talks about homes. Oh, yes, we need it for the homes. Uh, and that's true. Um, but if you look at the type of functions that were uh, being used for, for new greenfield development, land take, it's mainly businesses. And I think every Dutch person knows this when they drive the, along the freeway and they see another distribution center, another big box.
Here we go. The people offline are more important, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think I did, but now I have to go back to the window. Yeah. Okay. Back to here. I guess I should be also online. Audible. Um, looking at this, all these balls, you can't read it, what, what's here. But what it is, is a splitting up the type of urban development, the type of land take that's occurring for each member state. And the Netherlands, we have quite a lot of urban green, and that's a, a park, but it can also be a recreation area. And now I'm going to get to, let's say, the first gray area. Um, these are two recreational areas in the Netherlands. Uh, this one is near the coast and this one is more inland. Uh, so yeah, if you were to, let's say, sacrifice a farm and build a recreation area, it really matters what thing you're building in terms of soil <coughs> sealing and land take. But right now, looking in purely in terms of, let's say, land use, uh, you're not going to get that nuance. But that's a big difference here. Um, speaking of agriculture, about 20 uh, kilometers to the south, we have this uh, municipality called Vestland. And they're very well known for, as you can see here from the satellites, uh, horticulture. This is the greenhouses. Now, of course, they're all covered. Uh, a lot of them are paved. So you would think maybe not such great soil quality there. Um, but in Corinne, which is the, the land use uh, uh, data set that we're using at a European level, it's all just normal agriculture. So if you were to knock down some of these greenhouses and build a golf course or something like that, ah, that's land take because you're changing from rural to urban. Another one, well, these types of sheds, that's very, very common in the Netherlands, probably not the best soil quality right here. Uh, it's also covered here. If you were to knock that down and make a park, that's land take as well. So is these, you know, are these definitions workable? Uh, how are we going to deal with these, let's say, gray areas? Um, and of course, renewable energy. This is a, let's say, a land use that's really on the rise. Um, but what what is it in terms of categories? I think in Korean, many times it's coded as industry. So here you have this area, which is a natural area, nature, and then some industry right in the middle uh, in, in a kind of weird uh, pattern. And then this, of course, uh, we're seeing this more and more, uh, solar panels in rural areas. What is that? Is that Atlantic? The, the soil doesn't look very healthy, but maybe if you take it away, I don't know. But this is something which for me, as let's say somebody who might have to monitor this, this is important. And as planners who have to decide whether or not to uh, give a permit for one of these areas, should we say, no, we don't want to do it because of no net Atlantic, or are we going to say, ah, fine, that's not Atlantic. That's one issue, the, the different categories. Then we have another issue, and that's the scale. Uh, looking here, of course, you see that Veslon area. There are a lot of buildings here which are not coded as urban, and that's the, the, the colors here. So we laid two different maps on each other, buildings and zones. You see for the Netherlands, it's, it's done pretty well, but the urban areas you can see also well zoned. Um, Belgium is another case. Here we have north of Antwerp, and look at this area right here. This is all considered urban, but there's not a whole lot of building there. So what happens if you zoom in on an area like this? It's very, lots of trees everywhere, canopy covered, but uh, yeah, you get this very, very, very low density housing. And here you see this one's getting built. Is that land take? Right now it's not. not right now we're reusing land because it's been zoned urban and it comes an extra house there. That's fantastic what they're doing here. Is it? I don't know. But these are things that we have to talk about when we're talking about land take. Uh, opposite example, here's an area that hasn't been designated urban uh, outside of Warsaw. And uh, if you zoom in with, uh, with Google, what do you see? You see this kind of area. Now, so this is considered rural, but it's also suburban. Um, if you were to add a house here, uh, just probably be registered as, as another rural area until maybe they actually discover that it's actually become a somewhat of a suburb and then all of a sudden it might be designated urban and then you get a huge amount of land take. But these are things that you have to keep in mind when you're monitoring. It's not all that easy. And that was the easy part. 
the, the quantitative, where you just talk about hectares and count them. The really hard part is when you start talking about ecosystem services and the quality of the soil. How do you factor that in uh, with land use decisions? Then it becomes really, really complex. And we couldn't go into very much detail because there's so much needs to be resolved. So we just decided to scratch the surface to show the complexity by doing, let's say, a very simple calculation. We took a lot of ecosystem maps, services maps, 16 of them, laid them on top of each other, created a composite indicator for ecosystem services in the Netherlands, and compared them to Korean classes. So, of course, nature comes out best, you know, best uh, ecosystem service, no big surprise there. Big surprise is right after you see urban and agriculture about the same. So, yeah, right now agriculture is protected, it's land take if you build on that. Uh, urban is, of course, already urban. Um, but when you start talking about ecosystem system services, it becomes more complicated. Uh, what are we really protecting here? And if we see, let's say, it's much worse to take a, let's say, a hectare of nature than a hectare of, uh, of, of uh, agriculture, maybe you should do some sort of weighing. But then it gets very, very tricky. Should it be a factor 10, mm -hmm. a factor 2? Yeah. I don't know the answer, but these are things that uh, yeah, we have to consider when you're a spatial planner. When you get into what is spatial planning? How do you make these decisions? You're making decisions about whether or not to urbanize and how to urbanize and uh, densities. And the Dutch way of doing this is we try to look at different levels, different networks of uh, infrastructure, look at uh, water, soil qualities, also competing land uses, all these things. And then we talk to all sorts of stakeholders and everyone has a discussion and hopefully we come to a democratic decision and get to what we say in Dutch, the right function at the right place. And in this land take might be a consideration, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a big complex puzzle. It's not that easy just to say no net land take, you planners figure it out. Um, we of course have our own toolbox of plans and then we sometimes have some really hard plans that, that you can say we zone for, let's say, agriculture and it stays agriculture and you can't zone for anything else. So there are things that we, we can do, but how? That's, that's the crux. Mm -hmm. I'm going to end here with how we do it in the Netherlands. One last example for mostly foreign guests. I think the Dutch people know this. We have one basic rule that sounds a bit like no net land take and that is called the uh, Sustainable Urbanization Procedure, or LADDER. And what this does is it asks uh, municipalities, usually municipalities, who make a new zoning plan granting development rights to say, hey, explain whether there's a real need for that development. And explain, if it's going to be on a greenfield, why you didn't choose a site in town. Just explain that. So it sounds very weak, you know, you just explain it, you write anything down, you know, and I've seen some plans that do that, that come with really silly explanations. Yeah, oh, well, we didn't feel like it, or yeah, it's it's a real nice, the people want the really big houses and, and you can't have that in the city center, they want to be in the countryside, things like that. But they gave citizens the right to challenge plans, and they did, and usually citizens were companies you know, trying to get real competitors, but still, this ended up in a lot of litigation. And it started blocking plans real in real life. And then political resistance started growing. And right now, even this is kind of in danger of being uh, abolished. So even something like this, which is, the, we don't even have a known Atlantic policy, but this is also very difficult in our uh, political climate. So yeah, what can you do? I'm here now to listen. This is <laughs> my talk. And I hope that I learned something from all of you uh, in your countries about how you uh, deal with uh, no net land take. Um, so to so wrap it up, very early, there's a lot of ways to go. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, and I see it as a planning issue, uh, no net land take. We're the ones who really are going to have to implement this. And so it's time that we start learning from each other. Thank you very much.
thank you, uh, Mirko and David. Uh, I hope, Mirko, you have a, a slight understanding about the Dutch planners' panic that's now uh, arising because of the known Atlantic. Uh, are there any questions for Mirko or David before we go to the... Yes. Uh, in, the, in the simulation that you showed where the uh, land uh, use is changing, Belgium had a constant land, land change. Uh, it didn't really change so much. So could you explain that? Yeah, that was the slide about uh, how it's been zoned. Yes, yes. Because what happened in Belgium is in 2000, they zoned a lot of areas as urban. And a lot of the developments since have been really small scale and it's been seen as filled in and not take. And Peter is from Belgium and he's going to talk about this. <laughs> yes. I'm from Amsterdam. We in Amsterdam we have the ambitions to become a city donut, donut city. And there's also talk about the balance. If you talk about the balance in this case, where will be the hard struggle? Um, first of all, I would call yourself a donut city because that has different connotations in planning. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the donut economy applies to Amsterdam. Um, you come from a donut city, do you? I don't know. Portland's not a donut city. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I think there's going to be an interesting tension between the Northern Atlantic and the Nature Restoration Act. Because Nature Restoration asks you to expand the amount of urban green and many times the way people live in the Atlantic, urban green is already urban, so it's not meant to look if you build on it. So I'm thinking about Amsterdam North, where people are complaining about densification. They can say, uh, they ask me, oh yeah, could, could you help us out with Atlantic? I said, no, no, no it's not Atlantic if they, they build there. But it is against, let's say, principles of the nature restoration. <coughs> of expanding. Change of function. Yes, but people it's, at home Atlantic, here, it's, it's still urban. Yeah. So it's, it's urban green to, to uh, urban fabric, which is Atlantic in, this, in most cases, unless we define it differently. We're still at the beginning. So. I think, David, you, you pointed out the issues that we have in the definition phase, what, what exactly will be, will be land take, um, and, and your question refers to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question too? Uh, yes, I have a question for Mirko. Uh, the Dutch government has said uh, water and uh, soil system should be leading in urban development. There's still a lot of debate among planners and developers, like what does it actually mean? Do you think if in like 2025 the EU soil law comes into effect, like those uh, discussions are basically done, or, like the EU success is clearly like this is how you should do it. And that's how you have soil as a leading principle. I would say we have started some elements to linking soil and water. For example, we are measuring the capacity of, of soil to absorb water. We are asking member states to do that systematically, but not everything is addressed, especially not from the planning point of view. So there is room for uh, for developing things beyond what is in the soil. <laughs> and honestly, I think the Dutch discussion is more based on what's the best place to to land take <laughs> instead of the worst place to land. So, so it's not it's not really a land take discussion in the Netherlands yet. It's like if we if we are going to do some land take, con considering water and soil, what's the best place to do that land take? Uh, so there's a long way to go. The first time I heard about it, I was I, I always said we're like really good in land take. You know, we make polders, we make new islands, <laughs> we can take a lot of land. Uh, we're great at that, but um, <laughs> unfortunately, it meant something different. <laughs> um, if there are no more questions, I would like to go to the uh, pitches for each country. Are there online questions? Not yet. Not yet. Well, great. Oh, this is a short question. How does it fit in your scenario? Your scenario? <laughs> um, um, there's a question about uh, our future scenarios that we built here at the PBL. Um, we took. Uh, yeah, do you want to answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's in our report. We we took uh, some of the scenarios and we uh, calculated how much land take from scenario is in them, and uh, basically it comes down to there's a lot of latitude. There's room to choose. One of the scenarios has lots and lots of land taking, and it's very modest. Yeah. 
but in all four scenarios there was an end date. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's kind of hard to avoid. There are some work to do, I'd say, in the future. I have a question. Uh, how is globalization affecting it? Because uh, more jobs, more businesses, and people like moving businesses in the Netherlands, so perhaps that's also why your land is more here. So, how are you managing it? Are you thinking like a planner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about accommodation and uh, not an absolute. So, yes, I, I think that. Think you strive to accommodate that in the best way possible, and uh, it's many times efficient to accommodate that in only existing cities, but that's also tough in other ways. Yeah, but then it's like uh, you are trying to deal with the business people and the policy makers who want to make a lot of money from the environment and mm -hmm. economy, and at the same time, you're thinking of the nature, so uh, that must be a difficult debate and difficult, difficult negotiation. Right? Yeah, we just have a big controversy about the data center, which is you know, in the end income, for exactly these kinds of issues. And, and it's also, Arian is busy with um, both a floor space index and mixed use index to see, from a planner's point of view, um, which um, type of land use or business use is most um, valuable. Uh, valuable. So, um, so we're working on that. But that's all in that debate on what's going to be the definition and what will, will help us to get uh, on one side a healthy soils, but on the other side, like healthy living environment for people and businesses. Um, without further ado, yeah, one more, yeah, yeah. last one. <clears throat> Two brief questions for Mario. The first, you mentioned that it's not a law, but the idea is that we would face out incentives that increase land take. That could be a measure to go towards non Atlantic. so what kind of incentives do you have in mind that could be phased out? That's my question. And the other was David, and I mean, I think it's essential to discuss maybe also for money. Why agriculture is not considered like take? That's something that David said. Yeah, but also the, the you just, Yes. The, the yeah. GM, maybe that. Why not consider agriculture like large scale livestock agriculture? Like they, yeah. Because it reduces soil health. Yeah, concerning the first question, uh, um, I don't know the details, but I recall that they were found, we found the incentives uh, for converting uh, agricultural land into um, to, uh, uh, in buildings. Uh, maybe local uh, incentives, that's okay, that these have to be addressed. Um, and on the, so the second point is that agricultural land can provide, uh, if well managed, uh, all, all the ecosystem services. Uh, it's not natural anymore, it's called the semi-natural because it has been uh, substantially modified, but still it's uh, very similar to uh, in the provision of ecosystem services to, to the rest. So you can consider it as a land use change, maybe from forest to agriculture, but not land take. Uh, that's very dangerous, maybe, to consider it as land take, because then otherwise you don't see when uh, you go from uh, agriculture to, to building, you consider it still as land take, and then you are missing uh, an important moment. Uh, I would like to go to the pictures per land, and first I would like to invite uh, Peter Lacour of Flanders. Is he online? Yes. Yeah. Or is he here? Well, hi. Yeah. Good, Good afternoon. Can we hear him? <laughs> Peter, are you there? Now comes the most yes. Can you hear me? challenging, challenging and uh, Exciting part of the summer. The definitions of land take are easy compared to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter should be able to speak now. Yeah, but can you hear me? We'd like see to see him. Peter as well. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Exciting. We did it this you morning. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think you have to make me present. So. Uh, oh, nee. Uh, yes, it's me. Where is it? Where is it? Can you hear me? Uh, more. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to make me a presenter. So, uh, if you want to take something and change it to the then you could compensate. That's why we talk about the net. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, no, we see your presentation. No, 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 it is our presentation. Oh, it's... Uh... Ah. Yeah? Uh, I'm going to end, but then I'm going to use it on the computer. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah, that's... Uh... No, 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 no. This, this is my presentation here. The good news is we have sound. Do you have a screen sharing? As you do that, it will be good, I think. Ja, dan probeer ik het. Oh, ik krijg wel niet te zien. Nou, uh, nou, we hebben een verkeerde venster daar. Ja, ik snap ja. het, maar waar, waar, waar is het andere venster? Wil jij wat delen, Peter? Oh. Ja, ik zal, ik zal eens proberen, hè? <laughs> ja, kijk. Halleluja. Ja. Ja. Uh, uh, zie je het beeld? Ja. ja, heel goed. Is ja. alles in orde? Uh, ja. Also at home? <laughs> ja. ja. I think, I think and, it's... Uh, and Peter, English. Yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I will briefly uh, present the Flemish case, uh, more specific, the problem setting of the northern part of Belgium, the Flemish uh, region. Um, we can go into the strategic part of strategy for Northern Atlantic during the workshop, but I will uh, present this like a, a teaser, like uh, an intro for uh, the workshop. Um, Let's see, yeah. So the Belgium small kingdom um, has uh, underwent a state reform in 1980, and therefore we have four planning systems in our country, um, being uh, the one of Flanders, one of them eh, for the northern part. And since 1980, uh, every region has its own uh, planning uh, system, making things, of course, for our country more complicated. As you probably know, especially the Dutch neighbors know, uh, the uh, settlement uh, structure and area of Flanders is, is massive. Uh, one third of our country, 33% of our ter territory is taken, uh, according to the definition of the, the EU, is taken for one third of it. And still, um, uh, still uh, land consumption goes on day by day. So for, um, for us, as Flemish citizens, it's clear that we need to 
take action mm -hmm. to stop this evolution. So Flanders has woken up uh, some years ago. Uh, so we're not in denial anymore. Uh, we need to take uh, care of uh, our land in a more proper way. And uh, for planners, of course, in our country, this is a paradigm shift. As David uh, said before, it is a, a, a bit counter uh, in, intuitive for a planner to think about limits. But of course, uh, environmental topics set limits. And this is a new thing for planners who are more conditioned on growth, spatial growth. So this is a, a, a completely no paradigm for planners to take into account final limits of settlement area. Um, what has uh, been the evolution in Flanders? Well, land, lake, land take rate has been uh, decreasing over the few decades. It was 10 hectares a day, as it is now the case in uh, the Netherlands, I learned. Um, it decreased to five or six hectares a day over the past years and more, more recent, mm -hmm. uh, according to the new data of our uh, public agency, it is still decreasing. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure if, if it will keep decreasing because, of course, we have uh, had an exceptional period with COVID and also during uh, due to the Ukraine war. Will it keep up this decrease or not? We're not sure. Eh? But at this stage, it is uh, less than five hectares a day, so half of the Dutch uh, land consumption, you could say. We do not have any uh, definition issues because our public agency has set this definition in 2016. So for our Dutch neighbors, it might be interesting to uh, read more about this definition. It is an operational definition that have been uh, made by a public, the public agency in preparation of uh, maps and uh, a new land use map that was developed in 2016. So um, this definition of land take is um, for this generic example shown here. On the bottom side left is a soil soil seedling. In the middle at the bottom is land take and the rest of it is no, no land take of no settlement area. So all agricultural land and natural land is um, for, is, is the target part, of course, that needs to be protected. This is in line with the definition of the road, roadmap, European roadmap since 2011, and also the definition uh, used by the European Environmental Agency, as it is also um, online uh, by the European uh, Agency. So um, we have no definition issues about this, but um, we had uh, uh, the single one we had was about agricultural constructions because the initial definition is not clear on that. So uh, our uh, public agency decided to take agricultural constructions and soil ceilings also into account as land take uh, because the initial idea of the European roadmap was to protect land and if it is taken also for agricultural use it is taken out of productive production and out of natural state that is the basic idea and uh, how to protect land and all the rest is land take that's mo a more easier way to look at the definition or at least the initial definition as it was put forward by the European Commission and the European Environmental Agency the main topic for Flanders to tackle uh, land consumption, land uh, take, is uh, uh, zoning. We have an, a zoning problem in Flanders, as many other countries, by the way, but our zoning plans are binding. They have been um, gr uh, approved in the late 1970s, and since then only 5% of the surface of our region has been changed, only 5% of it. So 95% is still the initial zoning of the late 1970s, and there is an oversupply of land uh, for development uh, granted to um, proper uh, owners, uh, land owners, and so on. And this is the main issue, the main debate we are having now in Flanders about known Atlantic. Everybody uh, agrees that we we need a uh, known Atlantic policy. It is called bow shift in Flanders, by, by the way. But how can we 
um, realize this given the old plans and all these development rights that we need to uh, withdraw and uh, down zone. This is the a key issue and debate we're having now. A second track we need uh, of uh, on reduction is uh, devi deviational uh, rules. So um, rules in a um, law, planning law, allowing land take in agricultural zoning and so on. So this is also a key problem we need to tackle in Frondos in order to reduce further the land take. Two targets are put into our policy plan. This policy plan dates from 2016. Mm -hmm. And the first one is uh, the reduction and um, uh, achieving no net land take by 2040. Mm -hmm. So Flanders is more ambitious than the European goal, given uh, the situation of our region, that is of course uh, rational to be a bit more ambitious about this. So 2040, we are aiming at, and well, not only the, the zero point is, of course, uh, important. I think uh, the zero point, achieving the zero point is very difficult, but it's all about reduction, of course. Eh? How can you reduce land take uh, as, mu as uh, much as possible? This is the key topic. The second target that is put in the spatial plan is um, a soil ceiling um, target. Uh, stating that we aim for a reduction by 20% by 2050 in agricultural zones and natural zones. For the rest, in the, the buildable zones, we aim for a uh, soil ceiling neutrality. So um, neutrality for development zones and reduction in agricultural <coughs> and natural uh, zones. Do, these are the two key um, topics in our spatial plan. So how large is this conflict um, between zoning, old zoning versus new policy of non-Atlantic? Well, uh, uh, my research group um, calculated that this with uh, the data from the public agencies, and we came up with, with this uh, uh, number, uh, namely that uh, 60,000 hectares of development land is now at risk, still in agricultural use or natural state, at risk of development. In order to achieve non Atlantic, we need to downzone more than half of it, according to our calculations. So, downzoning is a key aspect for our policy. So, um, to um, wrap uh, a bit the, the Flemish case up, um, what has been done in Flanders of the bow shift? It has been introduced, announced in 2016, by which the Flemish region was the first in European context to set out the final limits. Uh, Germany, Austria and so on already had reduction uh, targets. We were the first to set a final limit, the real known Atlantic. But since then, not much has, has happened uh, yet for our region, unfortunately. The target was uh, put out more ambitious by 2080. Uh, so uh, the, the final uh, known Atlantic target was a bit set out for 2040, so 10 years earlier. Then, because we have a lot of debates about this goal in Flanders, uh, an expert panel uh, uh, came up with an, uh, an advisory report for our minister. That was also a new step. And last year, our Flemish government um, uh, reached an agreement on the reduction and how to pay for it. And this is in a way also a, cont a counterproductive political decision. Our uh, government said, well, we are willing to, um, to achieve the known Atlantic, but we want to uh, also agree on a higher payment of compensation. Yeah. So our government decided on higher compensation of the of the um, landowners, making this very difficult to do downzone for municipalities. So it was a huge debate with municipalities in our country saying that, there's, that it's made impossible to downzone now because of too high compensation costs. So this is in a way a counterproductive political decision. Also, the government decide, um, withdrew a plan to downzone forests that are endangered. was also a counterproductive political decision. A productive decision was to block residential reserve zones uh, last year. This was a de decision in uh, implementation of uh, non-Atlantic. 
and now we are struggling with uh, this decision uh, um, uh, of the European Commission of the soil monitoring law that suddenly changes the definition of land take after 12 years. Um, we were surprised about this and um, uh, perceive this as a counterproductive because all the work that has been done by the public agencies since 2016 now suddenly changes. And it's like uh, writing a book and suddenly the alphabet changes. And if you change the definitions, all data need to be changed, the policy uh, assumptions need to be changed and so on. So um, we were surprised by this change. It is also not clear for us what is meant by this new definition. Is it a no net land take or is it a no net soiling, soil sealing uh, target? Um, I'm not sure what is meant by that, but uh, maybe Mirko can uh, uh, explain this a, uh, a bit more for us. Thank you. wanted to go to Germany, but uh, our presentation from Luxembourg is also um, with an online guest. So I think for technical difficulties, it's probably easier to proceed with Ge with uh, Luxembourg <coughs> or Germany. Uh, I tried to call, but I, I couldn't get through. So, uh, Robert, are you uh, are you ready to give a presentation now? Is he here? No, 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 no. no. He's, he's online. He's online. Yeah, uh, he's probably waiting for his time. Um, yeah, but I think he only had. It's normally uh, we had the normal time. He only had five minutes so left until his time. I don't know. So we'll, otherwise, uh, yeah. Otherwise, just yeah. Let's do Germany. We'll, we'll try to. Uh, yeah. Now uh, we know how. To, oh wait, here we go. Here we go. Coming. Yeah. Oh. And Peter, can you stop presenting, please? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, there are internet problems in Luxembourg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then we'll switch to Germany. Um, yeah. I need some technical help help here. Um, so um, that was the pitch for uh, Flanders. So for the for the Dutch policymakers here, I would advise them to spread amongst the countries. We have Flanders, Luxembourg. Uh, Germany and the European Commission. So make sure that, that you're spread that. out uh, on the all all top of the all uh, four uh, breakout rooms. So we can learn a lot from our neighbors, as we heard from uh, from Peter. Stop. <laughs> and they have written that they don't see Mark. Yeah, I know, but do you see? Uh, it I, should I be. think everything works, Anna. So, herzlich willkommen. Yeah. Oh, this is not visible at home. This is not, not visible oh. at home. No. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, we're in the. Are you in the right meeting? Uh. uh happy to yeah, yeah. feel share. Huh? And now it's visible oh, at home. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, okay. um, in Deutsch, uh, in German, I would say Hals und Weinbruch, Anna. Uh, so, Thank you. Uh, good luck. Uh, and the floor is yours. Yes, I'm Anna Hellings. I'm from the Federal Institute for Research on Building Urban Affairs and Spatial Development. It's very comparable to the PBL. And I tell you something about trends in land tech in Germany and especially about the 30 hectare target. So uh, Peter told us that we have some targets.
<laughs> okay, okay. The most important one was in 2002, the National Sustainability Strategy. And in the strategy, we defined the 30 hectare target. And it's... <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, yeah, it's part of the Germany's uh, National Sustainability strategy it's initially established in 2002 and it was to aiming um, to limit uh, daily land the daily land consumption to 30 hectares by 2020 that was three years ago and covers new land use for settlements transportation commercial and industrial purpose it aims to promote sustainable land use and curb land loss minimizing adverse impacts on the environmental environment, nature and climate. And in the sustainability strategy 2016, um, the target was extended <laughs> to achieve a reduction of less than 30 hectares per day until 2030. So now we have a bit more time. <laughs> yes, and this is a very famous figure in Germany for this uh, thing. So we started uh, with more than 120 hectares per day. And now we are um, about 55 hectares per day, and it's to have <coughs> football pitches. It's 77, and we need to come down to 42, and less than 42. So it's um, we are kind of a good way, but uh, we need to do more. And build-up areas increased by 115,000, more than 150,000 hectares in the last five years. This equates to a growth of two, uh, more than 2% over five years. And nationwide build-up areas now account for 40% of total land area. And in the West, it's more than 50%. In the East, uh, it's about 11%. And the relative increase in the East, it's is twice as high as in the West. Uh, and where do you compare East and West? Is that East, uh, East the old East Germany, so the new states with, uh, yeah. Um, transportation areas covers about 1.8 million hectares, um, constituting 36% of SUV means the build up and transportation and settlement air areas. And uh, newly developed residential areas cover about 34, uh, 3.4 million hectares, making up about 64%. Uh, and um, the land consumption, land consumption, <laughs> is primarily driven by new housing and construction. Um, this also involves settlement areas, industrial commercial zones, and transportation infrastructure. This is all only on a lesser extent. And in city states like Bremen, Hamburg, or Berlin, um, they are close to a circular. <laughs> land use. So there we have kind of a no net land take. Um, approximately two thirds of um, <clears throat> our land take take place in rural areas and one third in suburban <coughs> areas and just a minimal and it has just a minimal impact in major cities. And in high rural um, dominated states like Bavaria, Schleswig-Holstein, Lower Saxony and the eastern states, um, Rhineland Palatinate and parts of Baden Württemberg, it's really the land take is the highest in Germany. And the settlement density, <coughs> density decreasing outside um, our major cities. So um, the loss of green spaces has been decreasing, but showed a slight increase since 2017. <coughs> and the expansion of settlement free areas is notable both in absolute terms and on uh, per capita basis and um, areas expanding with lower settlement density and a higher share of settlement free areas. Come to um, the effect of spatial planning, um, counter land consumption by en enhancing settlement dens density and increasing settlement density leads to higher value uh, creation and land consumption relatively decreases with strong um, structures and is curtailed through effective spatial planning and re regulations. And re regulatory measures can effectively, effectively limit land use expansion. The problem with the target is that it's a national target and it's not, um, 
it's not regionalized yet. So we have a uh, lot of problems that in the regions um, we have really high. Um, yeah, the, our uh, government can say what they want. If they if the regions want to decide something different, they can do what they want because the planning system in Germany is uh, structured like this. And with the regions, you mean the Bundesländer? And uh, not only the Bundesland, it's more on a really small scale. So the city, the villages, yeah. And the land use assessment, we have a um, system called ALKIS in Germany. So um, our data, uh, our mon monitoring is based on this ALKI ALKIS uh, data system. It's um, based on cadastres and um, Yes, uh, it has really limitations due to corrections into certain regions, especially we have a kind of a transfer from one system to another. And um, there are some problems in the eastern states. And we really need additional data from land cover analysis and remote sampling, uh, which is necessary for a comp comprehensive assessment. But um, that is something where we are working with at the BBSR at the moment. It's like the dashboard of Encora Fläche um for example which really tries to 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 uh um yeah come over this data problems and yes that's it thank you very much. Uh, i don't know uh if the internet problems in luxembourg are solved um uh, are they solved to uh uh Ariel. Hello. Oh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sehr yeah. gut. Uh, ganz gut. Yeah. Ah, uh, perfect. perfect. Now we just have to get you on uh, on screen. Yeah. In in the meantime, uh, I think it's very interesting to hear that both Flanders and Germany have uh, quantitative goals uh, that we still that we are still lacking in the Netherlands. Um, Davis, I so it, uh, I think there's a lot to learn why these goals are uh, chosen. And what they're based on. So uh, that's maybe something that, we'll, that we can discuss when we come back after the breakout rooms. Uh, so uh, welcome, bien, bienvenue uh, for the guests from Luxembourg. Uh, I think the floor is yours, basically. Yeah. Thank you. I think you just, your music you shut off yeah. your microphone. Marian, can you unmute? Okay, so you can hear me and you do see my screen. Yes, uh, yes but uh, someone says, can you press Control I for full screen because we're seeing your uh, right. we're seeing your, your Acrobat reader. Control, Control L. L. It's been. <laughs> I think you, you should just go ahead. Yeah. Yes, it's fine. Full screen mode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Now it should work. Yes. Perfect. Okay. I see your screen too. Look, Luxembourg, douze point. <laughs> so thank you. Um, well, yes, I'll now briefly present the political objective of uh, reducing land take in the new PDAT. But what is the PDAT? The so-called PDAT, Programme Directeur d'Aménagement du Territoire, is the master plan for spatial planning in Luxembourg, and it's the main program for orienting the spatial development on the Luxembourgish territory. It sets out strategic guidelines. Yeah. It sets out strategic guidelines and political objectives to guide the country's spatial development and to support the actors involved in spatial planning. It was approved very recently by the government on the 21st of June uh, this year. The previous master plan for spatial development was approved by the government um, in 2003, so nearly 20 years ago, and the new master plan had become necessary because Luxembourg has a very, as you know, dynamic economy, and uh, which leads to an important growth of jobs and subsequently uh, population increase and land take. 
Unfortunately, the territory isn't increasing and it maintains its uh, roughly 2,600 square kilometers. Added to this is the fact that Luxembourg, as the rest of Europe, is now experiencing the recurrence of extreme weather phenomena linked to climate change, such as torrential rainfall, flooding, heat waves, and so on and so forth. It is clear that by continuing, continuing to go on as we are used to, all the analyzed factors will degrade even more. Reduction of agricultural surfaces uh, uh, will continue, land take will increase, transportation needs, and in consequence, traffic will develop even further, which will uh, rise uh, infrastructure, infrastructure costs and so on. In this context, the main objective of the PDAT, so the Master Plan of Spatial Planning, is to, as you can read, strengthen the quality of life, conserve limited resources at the same time, enable uh, demographic and economic development within a limited area. In order to improve this evolution towards a more sustainable, resilient, and in the end, desirable future, the PDAT defines three main objectives. These are uh, to con con concentrate the development in the most appropriate spaces, to reduce land take and soil sealing, to reinforce the territorial spatial planning at the cross-border level as Luxembourg has, due to its attractive economy and the daily commuters from neighboring countries, a very strong interdependence with the neighboring regions. I'll now focus on the first two and especially the second political objective of this master plan for spatial planning. The first two political objectives are closely linked and are oriented by the urban framework, the urban system, uh, which you see on the right of the presentation, which identifies the urban centers, what we call the CDA, Centre de Développement et d'Attraction, and agglomerations which distinguish themselves already by a good accessibility by public transportation and present a high centrality, which means that they are very well equipped in different kinds of services, stores, and other facilities. It also defines the rural municipalities, uh, which are not meant to develop beyond a certain measure. But how intense is land take in Luxembourg? The actual land take is about half a hectare per day, mostly, as you see on the left, uh, used for housing, but also industry, especially commercial zones and farming infrastructure, as we've seen uh, in an example before, modern farms often resemble industrial halls, so there is an important land take. Unfortunately, land take, especially land take, happens in Luxembourg, uh, especially in rural areas, and not in the centers which the policy of spatial planning intends to develop. This can easily be seen on this map, where you see most of the land on the right, where you see most of the land take ha actually happens, and when I compare it to the prior slide, you see that it doesn't happen in the centers uh, we defined uh, in the urban system. You see that mostly these areas which are developing here, which aren't city centers, as you see here, which are mostly rural. So to reach the second objective, the reduction of land take, the PDAT defines two time horizons, or if you prefer, fixes an intermediate objective. The aim is to reduce land take by half from now on to 2035 and to tend towards zero in 2050. Expressed in numbers, this means that the actual land take, the 0 0.5 hectares a day, will be reduced to 0 0.25 uh, hectare per day in, in 2030 and tend to zero towards uh, 2050. As you can imagine, this ambitious objective earned lots of criticism and scepticism, but it is not meant to make further development impossible. A rapid analysis of the existing potential shows, uh, the existing potential as analyzed in the zoning plans of the municipalities, shows that there is still enough space reserved for new economic activities and housing, without even counting the industrial brownfields and the sealed land which can be reused, as we've seen before. If we go further in this analysis, we discover that beyond the existing constructible potential, there are huge areas of already built up land which have a strong potential for regeneration, in other words, development without further land take. There are urban and industrial brownfields as well as areas that could be used in a different 
and more dense width. The numbers in red, which you see here, uh, represent the potential of development on built up areas, show that the political objective is theoretically attainable. As you see, the three main agglomerations, so the first three uh, in the row, the Aglocentre, Region, Region Sud, and the Nordstadt, um, which in the uh, in spatial planning we intend to develop further, maintain an important pot potential for reuse, same as the CDAs, fourth in line, but also the rural municipalities. Nevertheless, the chart also shows one of the biggest problems in Luxembourg, because most of the non-built up areas potential of Luxembourg, it's the green uh, bar here, can be found in the rural municipalities, and it represents as much as 34% as of the total national potential of unbuilt areas. So how do we plan to attain the objective of reducing the land take? In addition to the options that are listed within the existing legislation, the PDAT considers two additional options, a change in the planning culture on the one hand, and on the other hand, the use of the transferable development rights. By a change in the planning culture, we mean the use of the existing potential through a qualitative densification or intensification, such as adapted construction or even reconstruction to build higher, add supplementary floors to existing building, buildings and use existing industrial brownfields, but also urban regeneration, which consists of, revitalize, of the revitalization of existing urban tissue by transforming monofunctional and underused zones into multifunctional areas. Another option, which is often forgotten, is the space that can be liberated when taking the cars out of the urban areas and regrouping them in, for example, transport hubs adjacent to urban uh, areas. In these, the cars can be parked outside the city centers, which would then be reserved for soft mobility uh, transportation, free of cars, the city or village centers present a huge potential in surface for densification and other uses such as green leisure areas, etc., contributing in the end to the local quality of life. One must not forget that by densifying the urban tissue, it is utmost important to preserve the quality of life of the inhabitants, and this can be achieved by creating common spaces with enhanced green infrastructure while respecting the local heritage. As I said before, the other big problem we have in Luxembourg is the huge potential for development in rural areas, contributing to an enormous land take and increasing traffic problems we already have. In this context, the transferable development rights are an interesting tool which allows to transfer the development potential from the rural villages to the agglomer agglomerations and CDAs um, defined by the urban system, resulting in the end, in a more sustainable development without disadvantaging owners. The challenge lies in transposing, transposing these elements, the new planning culture and the TDRs, into Luxembourg's planning system. Thank you for your attention. Um, sorry, we can't hear you. Not anymore. Can you hear me now? Perfectly, thank you. And please, can you stop the presentation from Luxembourg? Yeah, and Emily is asking a good question. Can we have the presentation afterwards? Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, you share can. it online. Yeah. Um, and David will distribute those. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that nobody challenges, challenges the goal of no net land take. Uh, and I, I see a very optimistic struggle to reach that goal in the future. Um, in order to reach that, we are going to learn from each other. Uh, there is a break right now that's about 13 minutes, I think. But at 14.45, uh, we start with the breakout rooms. I'll give Ariane the word shortly after to give you instructions. Um, after the breakout rooms, we come back here 
there will be a, a, a short, um, uh, a short uh, uh, record, yeah, record from the reflection from the reflection from the breakout rooms, and then uh, Ron uh, Domstrup from uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and uh, Silco Morgenthal, who was here, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, uh, from uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport. Uh, we'll discuss what this means, <coughs> and uh, when we're done, around 4 to 4.15, we'll have uh, a bottle, so we have drinks and snacks and further discussion. So, uh, for now, Mario? Yeah, uh, I don't have a uh, um, logistic remark for you, but uh, there's some questions from the chat. I would like to uh, perhaps David or Bilko can answer them. For, uh, there's two questions, two people. Mm -hmm. Sylvia asked, is there a figure uh, of the minimum amount of soil per person to guarantee a healthy life? Mm -hmm. That's a very good uh, question. <laughs> Each member state has uh, its own uh, current values and, and maybe targets. So it's, no, I, I think there is no uh, global value for that. OK, the, the answer is no, no global <laughs> value. Uh, there's Andreas Hengsterman mm. asked uh, uh, two questions. Uh, if the land consumption decrease, you've described really the result of an effective no net land take policy. Uh, I think this relates to one of the, the German presentation. Uh, could be the result. Oh, <laughs> could be the result of different investment mm -hmm. environments, slow planning permissions, or whatever. Please again, I'm just confused by. Uh, oh, uh, the question. Is, <laughs> yeah, I think we're trying to. Do that. Yeah, David is <laughs> muting. Uh, the question is. Um, yeah. No. Is it us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what's the question? The, the question is, is the effective no net land policy, um, could it be a result of something different, like um, slow planning permissions, uh, different investment environments, yeah. or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we, yeah, we are kind of a, on a good track in Germany, but um, we have a long way to go. Um, I don't know. I think there are some. We have some new regulations in our our laws. They really work. But on the other hand, we really have a discussion at the moment about new housing, and we had a housing summit this week. So <laughs> um, I don't know if we we yeah. will make it. But I think yeah, we need more regulations, and we definitely need a um, regionalizing regionalization. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the second question is. Very smart question as well. How does the uh, reduction goal relate to the current political efforts efforts to increase construction activities? The uh, people. Yeah, that's, that's what uh, you were just saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so for now, uh, oh, oh, there's more. For, yeah, do you have a question? <laughs> I also had a question after the German presentation. Uh, I was wondering um, if this target for uh, reducing to 30 hectares a day. Is this, uh, get, is this a driving force for a more compact, uh, smart uh, urbanization in Germany already? Or uh, not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but because we have this, um, after that we have some new new laws in the building code about um, internal development um, for mm -hmm. development and things like that. Yeah. Like, so the, like, like the ground field yeah. development. Like the, yeah, like the letter that David showed. Yeah, like the letter that David So this is all going away from your break. Oh, no. yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's grab a coffee and then uh, <laughs> while we're out there, Arjan will instruct where the breakout rooms are. What? Please do it now. Um, so breakout cards for the breakouts on the table on the sides, please. Yeah. There was okay. one more. Someone yeah. still wants to steal time from the break. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, one thing is about uh, we humans are very smart. Uh, and when you're tra tra talking about land use, you're talking about horizontal land. And Robert also mentioned we would make more, you know, we would go up higher. Mm. And as Dutch uh, in Netherlands, we also know how to make new land. 
So uh, oh, there are implications of creating new land. There are implications of going vertical. So are those being considered? Yes, this, um, it's, well, as, as a planner, it's, this is a solution, I think, to, to go more vertical because, um, yeah, it's, it's the most problem in Germany is that a lot of people live in single houses. So um, the amount of uh, square meters per person uh, increased a lot in the last years from 30 square meter to, I don't know, but um, yeah, I don't remember the figures, but it's really, um, it's really a problem. Just in single houses with huge garden. But that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Right now. You have to pay. Break. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have six minutes for the break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
So in this room we will continue with the EU in a bit. If you don't want to join the EU uh, meeting, then please let me know what other meeting you'd like to attend. Then I can add you to that room. Otherwise, you'll stay in the uh, EU session on the uh, main in the plenary. Yes. Or yeah. we'll continue in, I think, uh, five minutes or so. That looks good. Hello. Is it possible? I see the. Uh, okay. Here, breakout room here. The breakout session. I oh, know it's been adjusted, I think. Good. Hello everybody, so let me do some 
technical checks that everything is fine for the breakout session um, on the land take in the soil monitoring low proposal. And so let's check um, how many people we have online for this breakout session. It says 44, fine. The chat is active. Okay, I think I should put um, presenter rather. Yes. Okay, it's 2.52. We start in a few minutes when I see uh, we have more people here in presence. Yeah, Okay. Um, for those on, online, please mute yourself until we you speak. Well, yeah, most of all, yeah, they are muted. Very good. So here we Yeah, there. I'm going to be, I think, going around to different ones just to take notes. Is this working so far? So far, yes. I was checking the technical part and saying that maybe in one or two minutes remaining, we will start. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm the only one okay. from PBL here, so I'll, I'll, I'll stay here just in case something gets. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost, yeah, diverge. Yeah, as we used to say, we'll pool our ignorance. <laughs> okay, I will start. Thank you for being here and online uh, to this breakout session. Uh, my idea would be to uh, a bit finish my presentation, be more specific, but not too long, just ten minutes, then to uh, warm up uh, further a further bit. And then opening the for um, proposal for ideas on uh, how to best implement uh, uh, this uh, objective and purpose of uh, non-Atlantic or reducing land take and I would say it's the the negative impacts of land take on the provision of other ecosystem services. Um, so doesn't mean. Uh, uh, we cannot build up anything else anymore. No, that's not the point is if we do it, then how to do it uh, the, with minimal impact. Then, OK. You recognize this. I presented uh, the, um, the points of the monitoring law where the key aspects of uh, relevant for land take. Now we deep dive in that. Definitions. So there we say land take means the conversion of natural and semi natural land into artificial land. So simple as that. But then we, uh, yeah, sorry, we, previous, <clears throat> then we say, okay, what we mean by <clears throat> uh, semi natural land. So we call it when we, well, it's hard to call uh, agriculture natural land, so we have to call it semi-natural. So it means that it has been modified, yes, but still it, um, it maintains, a, as is written there, potentially high value in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services it provides. So when we lose this part, when we lose substantial uh, ecosystem services, we artificialize land and, uh, and this becomes land take. In the recital, so the initial uh, part of the law, which is not binding, eh, it's a, it's a sort of introduction to the law, we say that uh, we could we can consider gardens and parks as semi-natural, so that they would not be land take. Why? Because they continue, they at least potentially to uh, provide uh, biomass production, water cycling, water infiltration. Uh, absorbing soil organic carbon, so contributing also to 
uh, climate mitigation, basis for biodiversity. So that's the, that's the reasoning. And uh, the expert from Flanders, he was saying, oh, you are changing now <laughs> the definition of land take, uh, middle way. I would say the, the solution I see is that their target, we are not asking to change the target. Uh, the target, there is no um, legal provision for member states to, to define the, their targets. This is something voluntary and they can still keep the, the same. But it may be the right moment to think that it's not only a matter of losing food production, it's also a matter of losing all the other ecosystem services. So thinking to all what we are losing in that and trying to minimize that, that loss. Yes, we are changing the engine while the, the airplane is flying. Uh, it's a difficult operation. It complicates things. We think it's needed. Uh, this is a proposal. Uh, um, Belgium may raise a point officially to the Commission, say, why do, are you changing? But that's, uh, that's not for here. I mean, the, this will be for the discussion in, in the Council. Mm -hmm. So here we can obviously openly uh, discuss and uh, put, put questions. So that's about the definition. And then on the monitoring assessment, this is... In Article 6, we say just one, one phrase. Member states shall monitor soil health and land take based on the indicators in Annex 1. And Annex 1 is just below. So we ask total artificial land, so total land take if you want, land take, which is the yearly rate, it's different. Eh? One thing is what we have taken up to now since ever, so what is artificialized, what, we, what is the rate every year, and also the opposite. So uh, we could call it uh, reverse land take or renaturalization, coming back from artificial land to again semi-natural land. This may happen and it happens, uh, and because the, the the target would be on no net land take, so which allows plus and minus depending if you take land or do the reverse. And then we propose some uh, optional additional indicators like land fragmentation, because this is linked also with impacts on biodiversity, on the quality of life, or the land recycling rate. We have seen uh, examples uh, online, uh, they were measuring the impact, uh, other kind of impact, they were measuring the industrial part uh, or separating the different uses. So that's all very good, uh, say, optional indicators. Then, this is key, Article 11, says if we want uh, the, the most sustainable soil management, we need uh, principles to mitigate the impacts uh, of land take on uh, soil, soil health. Please note that uh, member states shall ensure that the following principles are respected in case of land take. We are not setting provisions on land use planning. Land use planning that's not the legal base for this, uh, this proposal. Uh, we are looking at the environmental impact. So in the treaty, in the Euro treaty of the European Union, land use planning legislation requires unanimity in the Council. So all member states should, be, uh, should agree to that. And this is not the case for this. This le legislation will require qualified majority, which is a different approach, and is based on the environmental protection. So we are looking at the impact on soil health and we say in case of land take, uh, so do as much as possible to avoid or reduce, so as much as technically and economically possible. So we are not asking the impossible, we are asking what uh, is feasible, what is uh, today, what is technically and economically feasible to reduce the area affected, selected areas where uh, you minimize the loss of ecosystem services. So, for example, why putting a building where the soil is the most fertile and is producing the, 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 the best uh, food? There are areas which are not fertile, so if you have to take, uh, uh, please try to privilege 
the, the part that is less fertile, lower quality. We are not speaking of health, and eh? we are speaking of intrinsic characteristics of soil, of being fertile or, or not. Um, and then, okay, there will be loss of ecos ecosystem services, so compensate this loss as much as possible. Um, can you think of uh, how this could be done? I mean, you can think to green roofs, for example, to retain a bit water or solution to infiltrate water to avoid to, to avoid um, to contribute to flooding uh, events. Uh, we can think to urban gardens uh, for even producing a bit of food uh, in uh, in in cities. Uh, or I mean landscape features to uh, to increase uh, biodiversity so the presence of pollinators of birds and so on for biodiversity i'm sure you have many more uh, ideas and examples than me so we we can also uh, discuss a lot on that and just to finish and then i really give the, the floor to you um, as i said contaminated sites they are relevant because if we we um, remediate them, uh, we can reuse them and uh, reduce the land take where soil is, is good. And reporting will be key to monitor the progress uh, towards. So this is the email uh, address and soil I was mentioning before for those who want to contribute to the platform that you send the request and we will see uh, to manage the, the request. So that's all from my side. I would propose that we first allow us to uh, div diverge in our discussion, but then the last 10 minutes, maybe we try to converge to some, uh, let's say, uh, conclusions. Um, I understood we will have to end, well, already in uh, 30 minutes. So let's have uh, 20 minutes uh, very open and then trying to converge. Uh, I saw to ends. I think he was first, and then we will look also online to manage all the all the questions. Please. Yes, thank you. But I was also, I was just in a room full of entrepreneurs. You're not making friends all over the place with this kind of directives. What's coming, hitting their business. So summary, to make a summary of all the discussions I had yesterday. But for me, it's also like in my presentation, I said the, the seven R model on refuse, reuse, uh, repair, etc., etc., etc. Refuse. I'm, I'm saying in my, I'm working in the construction field, and I said the most sustainable house is never built. It's less uh, production, less, uh, etc. But for that, we need a complete new perspective of, of economy within the planetary boundaries sounds easy, but how an economy look like within this planetary boundary? What kind of society do we want? Is that not <laughs> the underlying question with all the beautiful directives? And there's also a little bit correction because we have a huge, created a huge society with huge demand, huge industry, huge economy, huge, everything is huge. We also have to say, OK, a little bit less. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Indeed, it, it opens the perspective and uh, I mean, um, didn't want to hide it, but uh, we are touching indeed uh, to uh, several very fundamental questions here. But the, this law cannot solve everything. It proposes very concrete so, uh, uh, provisions. Uh, which goes in a certain direction, for sure. We know we have looked at the impact that this could um, give to uh, the businesses the negative and the positive because as every novelty it creates also new opportunities so we, we should not only look at uh, how it changes for the current business but we have also to see what it opens opens, opens up um, i think business is always about adaptation uh, and taking into account we have to take into account at european level the interest of uh, all uh, all parts certain businesses but there are other businesses who have uh, different uh, views i mean agricultural 
uh, interest would be to increase the land. They, they already see um, land is, is uh, increasing in price and uh, they cannot find enough land. So, I mean, we have to put together the, all the needs and take into account uh, the need for food security and the need for housing and the need for uh, to prevent uh, disaster and so on. So, but I would uh, I would not uh, too much focus on the global challenges behind it. Rather, coming back to see, okay, concretely what we can think could be uh, something that would put together the interest of businesses and answer to this need, which uh, which is a a need of uh, uh, our of uh, quality of life, finally, because that's what uh, what was what said before. I'm not sure. I mean, but yeah, please. Thank you, Mario. I work at Mirko. the University of Amsterdam. And Mirko. I, uh, Mirko, excuse me. Um, and uh, I, I study regulations. And so my question is a bit about how this regulation is going to work out, because you, you repeat several times that it's something voluntary. You're not. I understand correctly that you're not enforcing a non land take. Are you doing that? No. Um, sorry, maybe I was not clear. Yeah. So we have the soil strategy, yeah. which is a communication, so it's not binding. It contains a lot of actions. Mm -hmm. This is voluntary. Non land take is voluntary. The call for targets to member states is voluntary, is part of the policy. And then we have the part of the policy which is low. So the soil monitoring law is becoming legally binding, yes. So there are provisions there, and those provisions say what I just showed, Article 11. Um, member states should do uh, what is possible to mitigate uh, the negative impacts of land take. So basically what, you, what you're actually enforcing is the obligation to monitor and to mitigate. And to mitigate, exactly. Mitigate by compensating and reducing as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. So in fact, indirectly, it becomes an obligation, non land thing, if you are obligating to uh, basically reduce it. I would say it contributes. It yeah. contributes to reach the goal, the voluntary goal of non land take. So but if I am the Netherlands, the Netherlands doesn't have a goal, obviously, because they they already gave up on biodiversity. It's a disaster here, and water <laughs> quality is a disaster. It's really hopeless to that to a high degree. So why would I actually? And my my economy is a logistical economy. It's so big space. I need more. And why would I ever have a target on no land take? If so, the obligation is not to have a target. The obligation is to monitor. But that we are doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next step would be. So I'm, I'm just trying to find out how you incentivize some countries like the Netherlands or others where there's no interest at the moment. Yeah. In this at least it doesn't look like. Yes. My answer is you have seen the, already the differences between the, the few countries that were presented. How can the Commission centrally to say you should have uh, this target, you should have this target? No, we have to leave flexibility to them. OK. And that's what uh, we are we are doing. So flexibility to adapt to the local situation, condition, evolution, and so on is is key. So the the pro legal proposal is setting a framework within which yeah there is a sort of push to go in a certain direction, but leaving the flexibility. So we are not making mandatory de facto to set a target. But probably in the guidance, we will say, yes, this is one of the best practices. If you have a target, you know where you want to go. You are doing an effort. You are searching for solutions. You are looking for best practice. Well, they are already looking for best practices. So maybe um, the Netherlands doesn't need a, a target. Uh, we, we, I cannot say that. But uh, indeed, when we listen to the other yeah. countries, it seems like it's helping. So, yeah. yeah. But this target generally recognized. I mean, do all the countries, uh, European countries, recognize the same targets? Because I think that is the, uh, like the, the essential thing. Uh, of, of course, everybody can fill in uh, the, um, what is it? Uh, mm -hmm. the, how, how to uh, 
definitions. Yes, but that's not like you fun. need you need to have a common uh, a sense, a common uh, urgency, a feeling of urgency uh, yeah. to go for more or less the same targets. Sure. You are touching, in my view, what is the the point of awareness? So oh, yes, awareness of important. different people, citizens or policymakers of this uh, yeah. land planners and so on. Uh, you cannot impose awareness by law. You can help awareness. Uh, there are other initiatives which are of voluntary nature. There is the soil mission. There is research which is res uh, have funds also to increase awarenesses in a targeted way. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there are, but everything contributes. Uh, this is important. We will, uh, the, the Commission will contribute in that sense because we will get uh, reporting from member states, each one showing the, the trend. So we will be able to learn. I mean, countries will be able to learn from the others about the targets and the non targets, the, the trends. Um, so that will be important, all, all important to increase awareness. Uh, maybe first a uh, new uh, question, then I come back to uh, online. I can't see actually any. There is Behind your back, you can see, see the there. there. Right. May, I, uh, may I put a question? Uh, I'm a bit lost, but I hear a voice, so please, um, if you can just present yourself. I'm a bit lost. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sam comes back, I don't know why. Uh, let me uh, make the question. My name is Elisabeth Thoidou. I'm a professor at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, professor of spatial planning. Uh, in Greece, land, can you hear me first? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and the whole event. Um, uh, because land take in Greece is a neglected uh, issue and um, it would be very interesting to uh, know that uh, there will be more uh, um, uh, restrict uh, uh, law and uh, concept and uh, co context at the European, uh, European level uh, for uh, me at least and uh, spatial planners also but I would like to ask uh, if uh, this uh, law uh, which will be implemented, I suppose, in the form of a uh, uh, regulation. Um, no, uh, directive. no? Directive. directive. Yes, yes, yes. This means Sorry. that directive. Okay, you can't like to transpose within two years and make a national law about out of it. Okay, like the flat regulation uh, directive and so on. Uh, I suppose. Direct. Uh, yes. yes. Um, is there any case that uh, this uh, type of uh, the, the the content um, could be somehow uh, more uh, mandatory? I mean, and more detailed, because if uh, this is about uh, monitoring, uh, there may be many different ways of uh, um, to monitor, uh, in which ways uh, no uh, real, uh, um, uh, no real uh, effect will be achieved. Uh, for instance, if uh, there uh, will be a national observatory uh, to just to monitor the uh, transformation of land, okay, this is uh, monitoring, land take monitoring, but which the result will be of all this. Is there any case uh, to be more uh, precise the way monitoring will be applied? For instance, in Greece, we have a, a very a huge tourist development, and this is a very important factor um, uh, together with agricultural land uh, for uh, uh, um, land take uh, increase. Um, I, I suppose that some details um, might be uh, in this uh, uh, directive, which could help countries and local authorities, most of all, to um, promote uh, monitoring with uh, real effects. Yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, for this question, uh, I would say you may have seen what happened to the nature restoration law, which is a regulation. So it, it, it wants to be more prescriptive, more precise, as you say. And then member states were uh, against being uh, told uh, exactly what they should achieve in, as targets and so on. 
and uh, it had a lot of problems. Uh, it was it has to be uh, modified a lot. So being prescriptive is not necessarily a receipt for being successful. We have taken this into account in this proposal, and we have tried to, to put uh, a framework that is uh, clear enough, but gives the needed flexibility to member states to adapt also and to accept it. So um, being prescriptive may not be uh, the easiest solution. You, there could be a good proposal, perfect propo proposal that is blocked. And this was the case, actually, in 2006, there was a proposal for a soil, uh, uh, soil framework directive, which was blocked during eight years. Finally, the Commission said, OK, we withdraw it because uh, we cannot continue. So you see if we are too too strong on mm -hmm. one side, then we got, we get nothing. Um, I, you, I, wasn't, you, I wasn't uh, able to answer my question. Yes, sorry, uh, please. Uh, Lea, uh, European Urban Knowledge Network. Uh, you mentioned the NRL and awareness was also mentioned. So uh, something on, on related to that. Um, I noticed that, so with the NRL we've seen that it only, you know, it only hits the newspapers and it only, this, sense of urgency only uh, really translates into action and into counteraction and, uh, uh, once something is really on the table and so once uh, it trickles down and the potential effects uh, are seen. Um, so I'm wondering uh, for, uh, in order not to repeat it uh, with, with this uh, law uh, proposal, were you also considering uh, in, in the language you're using and in the frameworks um, that it needs to be understood by various groups uh, of, uh, of people and of, uh, of professionals also, like the, the planning community specifically. And uh, a particular question on this, like the uh, notion uh, the, the law is using is ecosystem services. It's logical uh, to be using that as a framework. And um, at the same time, it's something that I believe is not uh, very well established in many professional uh, realms also in the planning context, not as much as it should be. So ecologists, of course, know all about it, and we should probably all know more about it. But were you considering this also in the choice of using ecosystem services as sort of the main, I don't know, indicator and the main frame within the law? Can you elaborate a bit on that? And in the translatability of ecosystem services into planning context mm -hmm. countries. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this question as well. Uh, which raises the problem of the language. Indeed, as you have seen, we come from uh, the biodiversity initiative. So you find a language which uh, fits the biodiversity. But ecosystem service, uh, it's an interesting concept because it links, it shows that the environment is not something separate, it's something that is providing us with the well being. So uh, there is not such a dichotomy as environment and ourselves. We depend a lot of, uh, on, on each other. And this is important, but uh, if there is a better way to reach uh, those people who are the, the, the key actors in, in, the, in the change, then uh, I mean, there is, it's not a problem. Uh, and we, but we will have to follow the formal negotiations. So if member states, they will propose, suggest to us to use other terms or a uh, better explanation, that would be fine. We may be more explicit in mentioning, listing them. In the proposal, you can find this explanation. Uh, there is some grey literature as well, so it's a matter also of discussing. And this is, a, this I mean, this uh, seminar is a very good opportunity to uh, to start that. Um, do you have? Uh, do you are you thinking to any specific uh, alternative or? Not at all. I think it's a really good and comprehensive concept. Ecosystem. I just know that in the planning community, it's not as well understood mm. and embraced. Okay. And Yes, I see. Immediately struck me when I read it. But it's a very sensible. Yeah. Concept. Okay, thank you. I would come back to you, but please, uh, short, because I see there are other questions not online. At least I don't see them. There but were a of or people can just raise their hand and unmute and just ask the question. 
Yes, I, it's maybe better to uh, give this possibility at certain moment and then, yeah, but uh, just quickly, to to yes. The debate before. Of course, I agree we can't enforce top down and things will not work out uh, in most of the cases. But then why not, for example, coupling this uh, this uh, monitoring obligation with uh, economic uh, incentives? So it's part of the Green New Deal, right, this program. So is there any any financial backup on this type of law that could allow, for example, to subsidize or desubsidize based on the performance that is self-monitored by the states? Yeah, sure, sure. So basically, what we do with companies, they can set their own targets and we subsidize based on how they reach it. Yeah, this is a quick uh, answer for me. Uh, the law comes with a package of uh, like 10 documents. One of the documents is this called staff working document and it analyzes all the financing available at EU level. So all the, the EU budget, the different programs, uh, regional uh, 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 research, uh, common agricultural policy and many, many, many of them, all the opportunities for getting funds to go towards uh, healthy soils and uh, reducing land take also specifically. So that's the current situation for the future. The more money is available, the better for sure. But everybody wants more money. Money is not there. So we have to uh, really to, to find the, the best solution. There are possible synergies as well with the, the money for uh, obviously for uh, nature restoration because that this links. Um, we don't have fresh money uh, coming together with the with the, this law proposal, but uh, there is there are a lot of, of opportun opportunities already. And you know, uh, at the European level, it goes with the multi-annual financial frameworks of seven years. So this the current one will finish in 2027. So there will be a new one, and with the, this uh, new law, probably uh, there will be also funds. Uh, thought um i think there was first uh yeah i, I was you? intrigued by the question so that this the ecosystem serves right which is a very valuable interesting concept but also a lot of broad concept right so when you think about you have to select a location which has the best quality for uh, to, to preserve as much ecosystem quality as you can you, you have to somehow balance different types of ecosystem services mm -hmm. and it might not be an easy Choice. I can imagine many cases where the biodiversity values are much higher in urban areas than they are in the current Dutch agriculture areas. So it's a bit difficult how to factor in so the ecosystem quality. Uh, I think in, in, in this choice making. So, so do you make some sort of hierarchy in which services you value yeah. more than others? Or biodiversity, I can imagine, as an ecosystem service, is much more important than the production value because the production value yeah. is generated by putting a lot of. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, reasoning in terms of uh, ecosystem services obliges to have uh, uh, both local and uh, much larger view. For example, if you want to avoid uh, floodings, then you have to consider uh, the area of a river basin huh? yeah. and look, look, looking if uh, this um, uh, land take that you are going to to do that will go beyond will make the, the whole area to go beyond a certain critical value for uh, absorption and say oh if we do that and oh if we do uh, some more then uh, extreme events uh, weather events every 20 years will bring uh, such uh, flooding and uh, from 20 years it will go to then 10 years and then we will have it ever five years because we are reducing the capacity of the area this is just one example for water but then you can say we have targets for climate change. We have to absorb carbon. So if we uh, block this area to, uh, for absorbing carbon and then that area as well and that area as well, that we, piece by piece, we are going below a certain critical threshold. Yeah. So you need both local and global. Uh, I was thinking about the, 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 sort of the trade off between if even, for example, the flood limiting, then you want an open area, which is not covered with trees, for example, because the trees, they, they block the water and they raise the water levels. But trees are very good for your carbon sequestration. So you may have many cases where they tend to the sort of yeah, different objective. Basically. It makes the work uh, co more complex, yes, I would say, it, because you have you to have take sort of, more factors uh, into account. Yes. You have some sort of idea how you could balance it, with some sort of framework to, 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 to balance them out, if, if there's some thoughts about that. or. 
Yes, uh, well, my answer would be, let's see what what are the practices that uh, in the whole uh, European mm. Union level, because I'm sure there are good ideas uh, yeah. from which we, we can learn. I'm, yeah. I'm not supposed to be the expert. I saw in the chat. Yes, please, uh, online in the chat, uh, there was maybe yeah. a question. Uh, would the transformation of more natural areas into intensive agriculture be captured in another directive? Uh, so this would be a land use change, uh, which is about, uh, I would call them, yeah, degradation of ecosystems. So that's typically what is uh, should be captured by in the nature restoration law, which is being uh, negotiated uh, with council and, and parliament. Uh, but if the this in that transformation the soil health will go below a certain critical value, then uh, we will capture it also in uh, in this law. Yeah, and then I see another question: uh, How land takes a knowledge position the, the European Union's policies and strategies? As I said, uh, land use planning requires unanimity in the council so to make a law uh, on land use planning south sounds like uh, impossible so but obviously it concerns uh, many policies so from a voluntary point of view so with the initiatives and communications and strategies there are several uh, policies in, involved uh, i'm not uh, I mean, I don't think it's worth starting um, describing in detail uh, such a bit, I would say, a bit theoretical. Um, I see the interest of uh, going broader rather than uh, uh, coming to concrete examples. I can understand that. Um, happy to, to exchange uh, on, on all of this. Um, but if you have still a ex few examples in the last minutes we have, Please uh, raise them or, or share them even in the in the chat online. Uh, there was a question from yeah, the lady. I had a question, but it's, it's about the questions that are asked by you. And it, it was, if I understood correctly, the monitoring law is an obligation for monitoring, but there's also an obligation for compensation. Did I? For mitigation. mitigation. Um, yeah, mitigation, which includes compensation. Yeah, yes, compensation. as much as possible, and not yeah, today, yeah, yeah. but it will come if this remains in place, mm -hmm. when the the law will be approved. For the moment, it's a proposal of the Commission, yeah. so it's. Uh, so I was, I was w wondering this compensation. How do you uh, acknowledge it? How do you uh, judge whether the compensation is enough or not? If it's appropriate or not. And what are the consequences of this? Also yes. yes, so when we say as much as possible, it means we are not setting a, a threshold saying this is the minimum. Mm -hmm. No, we are we don't have the knowledge to do that. Mm -hmm. So we do uh, with the knowledge we have, and uh, that's uh, a sort of flexible approach saying as much as possible, which means taking into account existing practices which are technically and economically feasible mm -hmm. and that's where the exchange of practices is key and that's why we have also started with the, the guidelines in, in that sense and that's why I'm, I'm here also in this seminar where uh, there are uh, practices exchanged you wanted to intervene uh, on no, this I was, I was adding to the, the questions uh, to the question and that was first because I, I understand the, the first question also um, what is what would be the, the result if, if a country is not uh, compensating as much because we, we, we don't have a threshold that's what you explained mm -hmm. um, and of course we all understand uh, the meaning of doing as much as possible but there, there still is <coughs> a, an, an urge to do this so okay. uh, what, what does this mean in time I mean, yes now it's not Yes, so in the soil monitoring law, there are a proposal for um, a specific years of reporting, of evaluation of what was the, done and so on. Uh, concretely, this means that in 2031, maybe, maybe states will be reporting 
the Commission will uh, will look at it and uh, we'll have to assess if the, the law has been uh, complied with. Mm -hmm. If there are elements that indicate that this was not the case, then there will be a, there will start probably a, a legal uh, procedure with discussion with member states. So it will be quite complex, but for sure the law puts a, a clear pressure on going in a certain direction to member states. They will be still be able not to do it, but then, uh, uh, yeah, there will there will be uh, well, well, I'm missing. infringements, procedures. Uh, yeah, but of course that's not the goal. The, I think the goal for everyone, like we're here today, is uh, yes, to diminish, uh, absolutely. Or reduce that's or yeah. yeah, but that's why we are trying to. So the law is not intended to be the solution. We need both legal and voluntary approach, working together, exchanging practices and so on. Three minutes. Oh, that's very kind. We thought it was already over. That's the only thing we're polite in is Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, um, if I may, still one, yeah, one new intervention. Uh, following up on this, what sort of actions may qualify as compensation? Are we talking about payments? Are we talking about, for example, if you enlarge the urban area, do we have to yield some of the already built environment back to the nature so that the, the balance of the, uh, the, the land, land use is in uh, equilibrium with the national border? Yes. What is compensation? So compensation of the lost ecosystem services, which means you are losing capacity to produce food, Okay, then uh, you may think to to find a solution to on the top of the of the building to <laughs> create a zone for uh, for um, for producing some food if it was there before a field. Uh, if it is about loss losing capacity of the soil to filter and retain water, then you may have solutions to uh, infiltrate water instead of uh, washing it away uh, in, in the roads. If it is about uh, soil organic carbon, you may think of using wood, which uh, stores uh, soil organic, car uh, organic carbon. I mean, this could can be discussed. Uh, it's an enormous discussion. I mean, this line will require a lot of discussions, exchange of, of practices. I'm sure in Europe there are a lot, yeah. a lot of uh, in, uh, in this case, the Netherlands is well positioned <laughs> because, in fact, if you include that, so restoring the ecosystem services and you take it broadly without a threshold, then it will definitely be, you know, you, the law will be receiving things that have been ongoing already for the last five years, I would say. Circular building, building with woods, circular water uh, management in building, heat, also food, in fact, production, urban gardens, roof gardens vertical farming, all this kind of stuff. So in fact, that would become probably a mainstream way to compensate because it's already happening and there is already an industry that is that is already kind of working yes. on this. Yes, thank you very much. This allows me also to go to converge towards the conclusion and by saying that indeed uh, the law doesn't uh, necessarily propose something completely new out of the blue. On the contrary, many Would members of the compensation are already doing it. And it's a matter of learning from each other and uh, and um, learning from the others, the, the best practices to to go towards this common common goal for a quality of living. You have a carrot and a stick. There's no stick. Sounds, yeah. There's no stick. A board stick. Which one is the stick? Uh, All the, the, yeah. the people are coming back here? Threshold and, uh, the yes, they are coming back online. I, yes. I, I hand so it over it's to you. Thank you. Well, I'm not too sure <laughs> whether we manage, but thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll continue in a few minutes if, when everybody's back here.
Is it here? Sorry, it's in Gaum here. Oh, it's in Ja, ja, ja. niet belangrijk. Ja, we kunnen de mensen op een horen en net bij een uh, zilco. So, summary, how long? Just two seconds? Just, uh, yeah, just a little bit. different groups so I'll start with Mirko and BEC what do you what are your biggest takeaways Mirko yes thank you uh, I was very much pleased to uh, uh, discuss uh, and uh, get questions and comments and, and, uh, and reply I see really what I get with me is the interest on the subject the need to uh, speak exchange have a dialogue Try to understand the, the language of the, of the other. Know more uh, about the idea behind this, this proposal. And, uh, and it seems that indeed the, the good practices are, are for sure there. We need to know them because that's, uh, they will help a lot us in uh, going forward. Yeah. That's a bit uh, the take. Um, so uh, you see a next step coming. Well, next step for us is very clear, the discussion yeah. with the Council, but uh, I, uh, from this discussion I am uh, a bit reassured that uh, we may get there where, where we need to, to go. Thank you. Okay. Um, somebody from the Flanders workshop, do we do that with an online somewhere or do yeah. you do it? I can do that. We had an interesting uh, presentation and discussion, many questions about comparing the Netherlands and Flanders. Um, and the remark was that it was very interesting to me that for the Netherlands it's uh, not so easy to do no net land take because Flanders is uh, not so densely built as the Netherlands, uh, at least the uh, rural part. So it, for them it's easier to uh, densify and to use existing uh, land that has already been taken. A second interesting point was, uh, is zoned land, uh, is that land take? That was a mm. debate that we talked about, because yes. in Flanders uh, uh, a lot of land has been zoned already, mm. and do we count it as, as land take? And uh, uh, the, the conclusion from Flanders was no, 
uh, it's about the land use and not about the zoning. Yeah. So that's in short what we discussed. Interesting. Um, the Luxembourg, somebody from the Luxembourg group or someone online? Who was at the Luxembourg group? Yeah, I was at the Luxembourg group. Uh, we had uh, some uh, very interesting presentations about uh, the system in, uh, in Luxembourg uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the problems they uh, they have in uh, also uh, with, with the zoning of uh, of land and the special situation uh, that uh, uh, Luxembourg is uh, the very center of uh, of the land and people uh, uh, most people uh, do live uh, rural in uh, in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had some uh, discussions about uh, yeah the system in Luxembourg and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, we only had uh, Dutch participants, uh, and uh, that was a second uh, example of uh, an industrial area that they uh, uh, were converting to uh, a more uh, multi-use uh, system. Uh, yeah, so it, I find it very interesting to see the differences between. Uh, and maybe a, a question not entirely out of the blue, but do you think that um, understanding each other's systems and the difference, the difference in planning system uh, is more important or less important <coughs> in comparison with the actual land take? I, I understand this is a difficult question, yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, I, I, hear, I hear a lot of people talking about the different systems, but I think what we're trying to uh, uh, to tackle is the uh, uptaking from the bottom, the soil uh, yeah. ceiling. <laughs> I think in, in some uh, systems, uh, uh, <coughs> no net land take from Europe can, can help, and in other systems, it might, maybe it's it's uh, not that helpful. But uh, maybe there are uh, other opinions or the Luxembourg uh, people. I, I was in both Luxembourg and Flanders, and what I thought was very interesting is both had the same problem. And that was that there was an overzoning in the 70s and 80s for urban. And now they're stuck with this legacy of zoned land and landowners who have rights to build. And how do you deal with that? And the solutions they came up with were quite different. And so uh, in Luxembourg, they're thinking of transferring development rights. And when I told Peter about that, he says, oh, yeah, we considered that, but never working. So that's another thing. We can have the same problems and we can uh, then have a good talk, talk about the solutions, but uh, then it's not so easy to import the solution. Um, many times we can difficulties. Okay, so uh, last but certainly not least, Anna from the German group, the group of Deutschland. <coughs> I think one of the most important things was that uh, we need stronger reg regulations in Germany. And that really would be good to know where the success we have until now, it's a success or not, um, came from. And I think a very interesting point um, where we talked a lot about is that urbanized areas in Germany has um, a really low land take. And in the Netherlands, it's more or less the other way around. So um, Netherlands are more or less just urbanized. So um, this and also different uh, demographic scenarios um, makes it very complicated to address problems about land take and uh, regulations European-wide, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, for me personally, um, I, I hope that we can also work together with Flanders uh, Germany and Luxembourg to get more insight in, into both the different planning systems as well as the different views on land take. So it could be a, maybe a, a nice thing for 2024 to collaborate in this part of Europe and see if we can find some common ground. Um, I don't know if there's any questions about the workshops. Now maybe just more uh, regular question or comment or yes. Uh, you know, I feel like we dip, dip we're very deep into uh, what is the definition of land take and where is it coming from, but I, I feel like we haven't really dug very deep into the drivers of land take. Now what are the fundamental drivers that that cause this land take, and how can we yeah understand it better and then come up with better solutions? Uh, I, I feel like that could be where the discussion should move to. If we can really go further. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to respond to that? 
Maybe seven line number three. <laughs> about, uh, yeah, I was thinking about this the, uh, for this seminar, but just understanding each other and the problems that we get to when we see that the reasons why we're having so much land take differs from country to country, and so the solutions would be vastly different. Uh, sure. and, but yeah, so it's a combination, let's say, when you look at the scientific literature on land take, the drivers are both, let's say, autonomous drivers, like uh, socioeconomic uh, developments, uh, but it's also things that we choose ourselves, uh, or that we've done to ourselves in the past, yeah. like uh, oh, zoning sure. lots of land as, as urban in the past, uh, that legacy, or uh, that uh, municipalities are rewarded uh, fiscally for developing land, and that, that's a lot in the Netherlands. Exactly. Probably one of the reasons why we're so high on the scale, even though we haven't had any legacy zoning. Uh, we also have a online question for Mirko. Yeah, I'm, I'm just reading from the screen here. <clears throat> Could you elaborate on the definition of land take that has been changed? Why was it changed and what is aimed for as the definition is unclear? unclear, unclear? Has the work of the forerunner countries been taken into account uh, or, or is this suddenly declared as use, useless? I'm reading from the screen. Yes, yes. from, from not my question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so there are discussions, as I said, in council. So um, some um, countries may raise also the same question, and we'll have to uh, answer formally. This is not uh, a formal answer. But I would say in the past we were looking at uh, when agriculture, what the urban, I'm um, sorry, the rural becomes urban, uh, focusing on the production of food. but. In this uh, soil monitoring law, we are saying there is not only food, there is also the water cycle, which is essential to prevent the uh, disaster. There is also the soil organic carbon, which is essential for climate mitigation. There is also the uh, biodiversity aspects. We have to look at all those. So when we lose those ecosystem services, and because we artificialize, that should be considered as, as the, the land take to be, to be looked at. But this, uh, so it's an important moment where we say, okay, it was good, but uh, we can do better. We can consider more than just food production uh, from soil. Uh, this doesn't uh, destroy all the work done on, on to now, up to now. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it, it's an important base on which we can build. The targets they, from member states, they can stay as they are. Nobody is saying that uh, the target should be on the new land take, it could be on soil seeding the, the target, it could be on specifically on uh, on buildings, it could be specifically on uh, some <coughs> aspects. So each member state is free to, to set. So uh, I see it as fully compatible, the proposal, the new proposal with the, what has been done yeah. up to now. But we can further discuss, I'm happy to further discuss on that. But the, the definition sort of evolved in getting more depth into the definition, yes. not making it. I don't um, suggest an idea, also reflection on today. I'm building now a new project on, I'm working in the construction field, and we have in the Netherlands ambitions to build one million houses. Mm -hmm. We will, in the Netherlands, only now. It starts with ambition, that's why. It I starts want. with ambition. <laughs> but for that, we need a, a, a plan, uh, but also, but I missed, I didn't uh, uh, mention it today, that uh, we have a Paris Agreement. We have Paris Agreement, we have the CO2 emissions, and there's a budget for all sectors, also for the construction uh, sector, and also for this one million houses. If we combine this land take combination with the CO2 tax <coughs> for the construction, how this one million houses will look like? That's a good question, <laughs> which we will not answer in this seminar, but I see that David has an idea already. No, I thought we <laughs> could ask it to uh, our representatives from uh, the Ministry of Planning and uh, Internal Affairs. And, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice bridge to the, to the last part of our, uh, of our seminar. Um, uh, we will get two reflections, one by uh, Ron Dobbs and one by Silco uh, from uh, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Ministry of Transport. Are you doing this 
uh, parallel or serial <laughs> do you start in the circle follow? We end at each other's sentences always. <laughs> well, then, well, you can, that's you can, how we work. You can start as you had a nice bridge. Okay. <laughs> then the floor is yours, though. Thank you. Um, yes. Well, um, it, I believe it was the first observation of you, Mark. Um, uh, maybe better, it might have Flemish in the first session, who uh, concluded the Netherlands uh, had the Dutch are in uh, denial. Well, um, the good news is we left that phase, <laughs> and we are now in three kinds of modi. Um, first, we have a kind of relief. Second, we are still a bit confused. And the third, we are a bit nervous. I will explain. First, uh, the relief part. As we read the directive as it is now, we, yeah, in a way, we feel relief. Um, especially that it has to do with the fact, with the fact it's, uh, for a large part, qualitative, realistic, um, well-known uh, object, objectives, etc. So that's really the good thing of this directive. Um, then the, the second phase, the confusion, and, well, that's most of the part in line uh, with what, uh, with the things which uh, uh, David said in his analysis that has to do with uh, the definitions, the ways of monitoring, what kind of activities are included, which are not. In the German session, we had a, a discussion about um, uh, solar panels, uh, do, do they count or do, don't they count in the system, etc., etc. But that probably are issues you can solve with one another. It takes a lot of time, it takes lots of working groups everywhere, but you can manage, I think, that issue. And especially you can learn uh, between the several countries also here uh, uh, in this session. So that is the I had the, the, the confusion uh, uh, session, uh, section. Then uh, the third, uh, the, the, the part we get a bit anxious. And that has to do with the instruments, especially on the issue of known Atlantic. Um, in the, right now, in the Netherlands, we are very fond of our letters and our scales. Uh, we have the, the, the classic letter on. Uh, um, uh, uh, sustainable urbanization. And you also mentioned it, uh, uh, David, a nice mechanism to, to, to make a good and transparent way of where uh, to, to make a, um, a decision or where, where, where to build. But we are also working on several other letters right now. Um, so probably you, you, you will say something also about it, but it has to do <laughs> on the, the assessment framework on soil and water, a key issue of this government uh, uh, right now. That's also a kind of framework to find the right spots, or at least to rule out the wrong spots to build. So that's one. Second is that there also, and it has, it, it, it's work in progress, but there's also a letter or a scale right now worked out on agricultural land to save good soil for ag agriculture, so that's the second one. And third one, right now there's also a lot of discussion about, but that's a letter on the sun on land, also to protect uh, valuable agricultural grounds. So our key instrument, uh, the instrument we really love right now in the Netherlands are letters and scales. Um, or we like to uh, regulate on specific, uh, especially economic issues, uh, or activities, I, I mentioned uh, the data centers, and that was one of the first things the, 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 ministry, the Minister of uh, uh, Home Affairs uh, 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 implemented. And another one, which is also work in progress, but it has to do with the, the large distribution centers, to control that, to put them together, etc. So that's a, it's a second line of policy which really which, which which is really dominant right now and then i get to the, the nervous part here in the netherlands in relation to the to the director and that has to do with the compensation principle um one we don't really understand what's meant with it but compensation uh, it's th there is a sense of it but it also has to do with our dutch mentality i think 
that we have to look to other spots to find hey, if we want build if we want to build something here we have to look for spots where we can compensate and in a dense populated country in the Netherlands and we think we are of course we are a special case in the Netherlands we always think we're a special case there is a kind of nervousness about it and that's that also has to do with, with, with two issues. One, it was also mentioned, that has to do with the, the million houses still to build. That's a, we feel it really as a very a political issue and, 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 and huge objective, and that has to be managed. So that's one always above the mark, you could say. And the second, that has to do with the nitrogen issue, which also has become in the Netherlands a discussion about compensation, Unification, etc., etc. So that are the two, well, say, uh, nerving uh, issues uh, uh, for us uh, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, no, I keep it on that point. That's you, do, you, do you feel better positioned after today to uh, talk back to your minister? Yes, but I still don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> uh, um, and, and I think you have to get back uh, when we have drinks on the question of the one million houses. How we're going to do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will keep it a bit shorter. Um, I would add uh, one phase, and that's the uh, enthusiastic phase, because. Um, yeah, I think we, we have something to look out for, uh, something that gives us tools to improve soil quality and improve our sight and our view on soil quality. Um, as you mentioned, we love our letters and scales. They're even more. We have a uh, sustainable urbanization uh, scale. We have now a climate adaptation scale. Uh, so <laughs> we have a lot of them. And um, as was mentioned earlier, we had the decision to make water and soil leading in our decision processes. And in this letter, we even as said, reduce soil sealing. So we already made the decision that this is important for us. There's no hard measurement combined to that. So uh, that's where the nervous part of you come in. Um, the monitoring directive is for all member states. <clears throat> But in working it out, we're very, very isolated. So every country now looks, oh, how can we measure this? How can we measure this? So I'm very thankful for uh, ABL and David uh, to, to organize this day because it re it's really important that we broaden our, our horizon and that we talk with each other because we, we, are, we have specific, uh, specific situations, but we all look at the same uh, challenges. So I uh, thank you for this. Um, <clears throat> I joined the breakout group from Merco, and I was really happy to see the discussion about the concept of ecosystem services. I, like two years ago, I was really critical of it. It's anthropocentric, and why do we need a concept that puts like, uh, like a value on it? Uh, we know that nature has intrinsic value, but it's so valuable because you can make visible what the, um, the advantage is to have the green in your environment, to have open soils in the environment, to have uh, water infiltration in the environment. You make a really close connection between everyday life and the natural systems that are left. So um, I connected with the discussion that uh, David had in this presentation with uh, the quantitative or the qualitative look when we are already using the ecosystem services in uh, many parts of, for example, the uh, directive, then it's only logical when Merkel says in the breakout room that compensation can happen on the ecosystem services level as well. So we do not have to uh, look at, okay, one square meter here is uh, sealed, one square meter here has to be opened, but which ecosystem services are lost? And how can we compensate them? And as one member of our record group said, the solutions are here in the Netherlands already in practice. We have vertical farming, we have green roofs, we have uh, special water infiltration systems. We're in the inner cities, we're building valleys to improve water infiltration. So we already have the solutions 
um, in part in practice. And this is a positive lookout that can really help us in our way forward. And that's why I think the enthusiastic uh, uh, phase should be added to the list. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, I, I think you you both discussed a little bit uh, of the solution for the one million houses that need to be built. They need they need to be you know, nature based solutions. They need to be nature inclusive. They need to fit into uh, the ecosystems, uh, the ecosystems. So um, I, I think after our first scare in January, when it was still like short days and the dark period of winter, um, where we now have a, a more clear outlook on solutions and how to deal with this. Um, uh, before we end, I would there is a um, on the Slido there is a short uh, evaluation of this yeah, question. It's a short questionnaire. I think it's four mm. questions. If you can fill it out, it would be really helpful. Um, I would like to thank some people. Uh, first of all, uh, ESPON and uh, the European Commission to make this possible. So thank you. Uh, a little hand of applause, maybe for. Uh, from, uh, uh, the PBL, I would really like to thank uh, Arjan, Bas, Martijn, and David, who will on getting all the data and uh, this uh, seminar from the ground, so thank you. And, uh, of course, I would really like to thank all our guests, from, like from Mirko and Anna to the people uh, at the screen who helped us uh, in the great discussion, uh, Marianne of Espon, of course, so thank you <coughs> for being here. I hope you, um, you join us uh, for some drinks. And, um, and discuss further in the hallway and, and take the positive outlook that Ron and Silco painted uh, in, in the end of the session uh, back home. And um, we will continue with this topic. Uh, no net land take uh, or land take will not stop after this afternoon. So um, if you want to stay in touch with us, please do. And um, our advocate is uh, David Aver, so uh, grab him while you can. And, uh, <laughs> Enjoy. I have one question. Uh, I was discussing with Helene here. About, uh, we are missing out on nature restoration, and we are we are talking about talking working together. But uh, our ecosystem, which we are calling as a service, we are totally neglecting the wildlife, the nature, biodiversity, biodiversity and uh, we are nature restoration. Yeah, which is also a big issue. I see a nice agenda coming for our third seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I would say uh, some environmentalist over here as well. So yeah. philosophers, I was because then we are being very human centric rather yes. than being for the planet. Yes, you know, I, I totally like, agree. Oh. We have to met the PBL, so uh, I'm sure that we will get back to that. So thank you all and uh, have a great afternoon and hope to see you back here at Beda or maybe at S1 or at DC. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 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 My family is joining me. Yeah, we'll try. Yeah, uh, but if you have to buy...
Just outside there are snacks and drinks. And there are warm snacks. So. Yeah, what is interesting in for us is that uh, the Netherlands is uh, this kind of interesting case because it's a pioneer in this kind of uh, addressing this kind of uh, problems all together. Experiment. We look at this as a really high view of the We will continue to show. And come with the industry, also with Maar eigenlijk, niet zo slecht niet. Ik ben wel te voetbal. Ik ben Champions League kijk. Want dan mogen maar vier teams tussen Ja, 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 sorry. Ja, Ik werk voor het ministerie van Landbouw. Dit is een uitdaging. Ja. Ik ben hier in het op een Ik Nou, het is gewoon een dit is het vraagstuk waar ik mee bezig ben. Ik heb ook nog gewezen naar Wegens kader van het landbouwgrond en de kwik van Waller. Ik ben daar een beetje mee bezig. Ik vraag een beetje van hoe past dat binnen al het andere dat we willen? Ja, want nou ja, dat is natuurlijk wel, we hebben gewoon een transitie in het gaan met de regie, met het tekort. En zeg maar, we kunnen, niet, we kunnen bijna geen niet 100% landbouw onderhouden. Dat kan eigenlijk zeg maar, gezien dat we gaan. En dan is de vraag van wat, hoe komen we dan tot een goede afwerking? En dat is eigenlijk wat we willen. Ja, dat is het ja, 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 dit, uh, deze thema is helemaal niet. Ja, ik ja, word al in twee keer Ja, ja. En daar heb je nog een ja, 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 Ik moet in Nederland een exportsector. Ik heb een marketing. 
No, no, they are no? very important. Yeah, yeah, they're really important. And cool they are the very, uh, and very, uh, uh, and the, no, uh, 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 unsustainable, sustainability, uh, how they can think and apply for our systems. And to make the problems more sustainable, but it's very complicated in the sense that what we think is sustainable doesn't work out sustainable. So we are trying to make a, a new moves. And, uh, and especially it's, it's uh, it, we know we have to all these uh, products, uh, uh, the people who are screaming now are not, they, they, mm -hmm. no farmer is the same. And there are lots of young farmers, they really try, they are very aware, and you want to have uh, a proper, sustainable uh, company, which is future. Proof. And then uh, I think this was really we were talking about scenarios. And uh, that, that's, the, that's a very important thing. We have to think about the scenarios and how we implement uh, things and connect it. Uh, and that is another type of monitoring. Um, um, because uh, the, the real scenario, the, the, the scenario that will come out, will be always different from the scenarios we think of and that but you need to be prepared and so that you are flexible and, 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 and what is it uh, 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 and and the uh, uh, resilience 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 is a yeah, that being uh, uh, that yeah. Yeah, but you yeah, see also political aspects. Okay, yeah. I say all that the, when we take into account nature and biodiversity, environment, and the in all business cases, we get a bit of the Actually? Then the whole system will was measuring itself. What was, was the best thing? It was was it was, it was, it was, it was it yeah. Was. So, so we can we learn met, from. We, we messed up, so we get we get yeah, the uh, uh, yeah. 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 And then we, we messed up, and that was the the the, the, the bill was the comparison yeah. between bill that we had messed up last time of years, and now we have to restore it with restoration rules. Yeah. Uh, and farmers, that's an important role, but if you talk to farmers, I think the that uh, I go to farm for SVAC and they have evenings about discussion with farmers and the community. And they are stuck in the system between two markets, finance, rule yes. yes. uh, yes. regulations, yes. Exactly. etc. Et 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 so it's they, really they want to change it, they see the yeah. laws to change, yeah. but they couldn't yeah. because they are stuck. Yeah. I know, I know. That's yeah. terrible. It is a system of rules regulation is possible but not easy. And you also need to work on that. Also because uh, an awareness. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we got to the things. Yeah, we're looking for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you do today? We'll exchange more. Yeah, don't worry. worry. Yeah, we're we, we, we really welcome.
in on looking straight ahead and the foot with one eye is aware of the of the laughter and the other eye and when you keep on keeping you keep on looking straight but you keep on also looking at the sense at the sense and then your your vision will widen and you will see new things. And it's maybe it needs a little training, I don't know. But we know it's it's the It's the idea. Yeah, but you know, especially nature. Yeah, and they call it a broad view. And you don't look at one self, you don't look at the other self, but you look wide. And what we also call the relation to our system. But look at the benevolence uh, agency, uh, enterprise agency. Uh, they meet a lot of people. And then, and then you can talk about how you know it. And you can think of that. And you can think of that. No, you can just be yourself and you can be an expert you are. Be convinced of that. And you will have the right to live.
Thank <laughs> you. 